Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go live on S4 with Eric Cooper. Prepare to go to the edge. Three years. Over 1,000 followers. 30,000 downloads in the archives. Welcome to S4. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to S4, the official radio broadcast of Forest Moon Paranormal, with host Eric Cooper and our panel of enlightened minds. Coming to you live from FMP headquarters located in the heart of Skagit Valley, Washington, at the base of the majestic North Cascade Mountains. We will take you through a journey of exploration as we examine every aspect of the metaphysical. From spirits, UFOs, Bigfoot, and conspiracies, to grounding, protection, astral travel, and everything in between leaving you with a better understanding and comprehension of the world around you and the entities that inhabit it. Join us every Saturday night at Spreaker.com and locally on KSVU 90.1. Don't forget to check out our new webpage at www.s-4radio.com of Forest Moon Paranormal coming to you live from the FMP headquarters in the heart of the Cascade Mountains in Concrete, Washington. FMP is a highly active emergency response team for all aspects of the paranormal from aggressive hauntings to alien interactions, Bigfoot and other cryptids, and everything in between is terrifying. S4 is the voice where we discuss these things in detail. Not only can you find S4 right here on Spreaker, but for our local listeners also on KSU 90.1 FM, from 10 to 12 Saturdays with pre-recorded shows. So, you know, it's the week after Paracon, and our Keith Andrews releases a new book, Alien Races of the World. And so tonight we thought it'd be fitting just to talk all things alien races with our Keith Andrews. He's our alien race specialist. He wrote the book. And do you have a copy yet? So tonight, we're just going to talk all things alien races. Tonight with us, we have Cole Wegleitner, our technical analyst, Kayla Wegleitner, our research specialist, R. Keith Andrews, our alien race specialist, and Par- well, he was a Paracon speaker, Chris Dodge, EC team, and Paracon presenter, and Brent Dodge, a rastral team. So how are we all doing tonight, guys? Perfect. That's great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm, um, you know, it's a week after Paracon. I have unwound. I did get an A on my on my final capstone paper from school. That was another stressor on me before Paracon. So, yeah, I should be, you know, hunky-dory. But, no, we have cases after case after case still coming in. And school, of course, didn't stop. Now I'm in psychology and in the industrial world. So, yeah, yeah. So, it's kind of nice. I didn't have to do any research for the show tonight because it's pretty much a straight interview. I just had to come up with questions. That was it. 
Not to mention, so we have two cases coming up in Ferndale that will be physical location cases. Um, and we have another, you know, we don't have many in the chat room, but who has ever seen what they call a ghost car? Yeah, <laughs> that worked. I put my hand up. Right? Uh, you know, Cole saw it, I saw it, because I was taking them to try to find a new car. And lo and behold, there's taillights in front of us on South Gadget, and the taillights disappeared. Well, you know, if you're going to take him out to find a new car, can you find him one that isn't a ghost car? Because, yes. I mean, I have trouble finding my car in the car. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. We don't want a ghost car. Um, that was... If you buy the car, it turns into Christine, not a ghost car. And that's even worse. If it, <laughs> no, if it, takes, if it takes ghost gas, I'm okay with it. Right? No, that would be okay. It's ghost money to, do, to, to fill it. And that does remind me of a story of the haunted Hemet. No, wait. It wasn't a Hemet. It was a Het. So, I've told you before, the Hemet is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I want to say six axle. And they're used for aviation fuel. They're used for cargo. And they're used for, well, the wrecker, which the wrecker is big enough for an 18-wheeler tow truck. Um, now, a hat is bigger than a hemet. And it's used basically as a flatbed truck that carries tanks. Like the M1 tank, the uh, <laughs> yeah, it's huge, and it's all high tech. So, in the unit I was in, we had this hat that she and I say she, but she was in Bosnia, and she actually killed some Bosnians in a convoy. So you've got that part of the story. So, you know, now we're in Germany, and this particular het would start herself up when she wanted to. Um, yeah, you want to talk about haunted, you don't, you don't want a haunted het. That just don't work. <laughs> um, but yeah, they even had the technical, the technical support from here in the United States come to Germany to check this head out. You see if there's any technical issues, uh, you know, electronic issues. The truck passed all tests. They couldn't figure it out. Um, but, yeah, haunted head. <laughs> and we named her Christine. Anyway, tonight it's alien races. I don't know why I went on that tangent, but, yeah. So, anyway, the, the, the team <laughs> is going to be walking South Schedule Highway with uh, EMF meters, dual reading thermometers, uh, the full spectrum camera, uh, possibly get Mike uh, up here, down here with his uh, proximity meters. And yeah, it's going to be a long walk. But we'll have vehicles escorting us with, you know, four ways on and whatnot. And any kind of a ping we find, we're going to do our research on it and see if there's any disasters or car wrecks or things like that in that area. It's going to be fun because I like South Skagit Highway anyway. So it's going to be a fun walk unless it's snowing. If it's snowing, I don't know. We might not do it. <laughs> uh, anyway, anyone got any comments to throw in before we get started on this interview? I got my coffee. I'm good. All right. Um, Cole, tell us about Patreon. Okay. For those of you that haven't heard of Patreon, it's a uh, um, page that people create that um, create different things. So for us, it's creating podcast radio, where, and our Patreon is FMP slash S4 Paranormal. We have four tiers on our Patreon, and Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You could sign up for any of these four tiers. They are awesome. Each one of you gets you something and um, supports FMP and S4 at the same time. So 
go on there, sign up for a Patreon account, and add us to your list. Excellent, excellent. I'm always thinking of fundraising ideas because we do need uh, new tech, and of course, Paracon, uh, S4, everything we do comes out of pocket. We never charge for our cases. We never charge for the training we do. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not asking for money, but it is always nice when we have supporters. Anyway, on with the show. So, Keith, your first yeah. question tonight. What got you into alien races? And with that, have you always known you could communicate with them? Um, well, always is a little bit of an odd question, but the answer to that part, yeah. <laughs> Understanding my always is a whole lot longer than yours. But what got me into it was... The, the day I was born, I ended up in an incubator and died. Ran into the council at 12, and at that point, found out that humans were not the only people on this planet. That's the Reader's Digest answer. Because, ultimately speaking, what I, what I came to be aware of before I was even able to, able to walk, never mind talk, was that humans were, quite frankly, very small and very far down the evolutionary totem pole. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so, I have to say my opinion hasn't changed much. So I, I, want to, I want to clarify, too. So tonight we're treating it like we, we've never met our Keith Andrews before. Um, you know, we all know you. You all know, you know us. Uh, you've been on the show, what, a year and a half? But... For new listeners, which we always we're getting new new listeners all the time, I want them to meet R. Keith Andrews, the author of Alien Races of the World. And the first question they're gonna come to mind, I know, is who is R. Keith? How did he uh, come upon the knowledge of all these races that he writes about? Well, I, I should clarify one little detail. The book is actually just races of the world as in plural, worlds. Okay. The reason being, all the races in it are not alien. Okay. Okay. Because understand, I don't know the ratio, but probably close to half of them are what I call ancient races. They evolved on Earth and are frankly still here. Right. Gotcha. So tonight we are going to focus mostly on the alien races. If there's anything you want to add, though, by all means add it. Um, now, you remember multiple lifetimes. Yes. Right? So have you always been able to communicate with with off-world races uh, in other lifetimes as well? Um, not in every one of them, but in, in the frame um, I've at least believed in them in every race or in every in every lifetime. Some of them I have not had communicative capacity for. Okay, okay like I know when I was when I was running around in about 1600, 1600 AD, I was far too caught up in, in making money in the material world to bother worrying about the off worlds. Now, have you ever been in off world? race in a past life. Yes. As a matter of fact, well, there have been a few of them, but one of the most prolific, if you will, is is something called the Xerxix. Xerxix are simply put, from human standpoint, they are nothing but a spark of energy. Okay. Okay, but I spent I spent literally eons upon eons as a Zerzik. So, by showing up as a spark of energy, these are the races that people see that might just be uh, like a, a, maybe, not a shadow, but like an energy cloud? They may show up like an energy cloud. They more more often than not show up as that kind of fleeting, uh, fleeting orb that you might see. Okay. Okay. And where did they come from? Um, way before this world was built. Um, basically speaking, and now the way I look at time is this. If you know the, the theory, the Big Bang Theory, mm-hmm. about the creation of the universe, this is a repeating cycle. Okay. Now, as a Zerzik, 
I was an adult already. Why well, I, I call that I call that that big bang, if you will, a flip. And when I was an I was already an adult six flips ago. Okay, so we are talking a long time. When you think in right. terms of Earth itself is roughly speaking 5.4 billion years old. And it's a young planet. Might give you an idea how far back my memories go. So did they, did they come from, are they in this galaxy or did they come from another galaxy or? Technically they come from a, from a whole different world, like a whole different existence. Okay. Taking the entire universe, everything you know about it, Breaking it down to its to its subatomic levels. Do that six times. They were there before that happened. And so, when that happens again, they'll still be. So are they a te- technologically advanced race? No. Okay. Quite frankly, they don't have technology. They've evolved so far beyond it; they don't require it. Do they have a language? Yeah, but you'd see it, they speak in, in photonic, meaning they literally speak in waves of light. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, the, the idea that, that I think it was Spielberg that wrote um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when they came up with the idea of speaking using the, using the lights, mm-hmm. that is the only way that you would be able to communicate with these guys. Well, that's not quite true. They they are telepathic because of the way that they work with the electrics. So most races are telepathic, are they not? Or are there any any races and, out there yeah. that speak languages? There are very few races comparatively that are telepathic. Okay. Most have their own language. Okay. Now granted most do not speak human. You know, they, most do not speak to her and they can't even get their mouth wrapped around it. But most races have a language of their own, be it, be it a vocal one or an optical one or simply an auditory that isn't vocal. Many of them have a sign language that they use. Okay. I'm just typing in the chat room here real quick. Okay, so... um. <laughs> so you were an off-worlder in, in past lives. Uh, were the Zertex the only one? What you mean? Were they the only race that I've been? Yes. No. Okay, there well, are a number of them. I mean, quite frankly, I have been, you know, plants. I've been, I, for, a while, for a long time, I decided to take on the life of a, literally of an entire planet. Decided I didn't want to do that again. I'll tell you, that's just <laughs> important. I mean, there's a lot going on, but you get a lot of annoying problems that you can't do stuff and get rid of. Global warming. All right. So, what oh, is, what, who is the life of Earth right now? Do you, by chance, know? Earth itself? Yeah. Many people call it Gaia. Gaia or Gaia, depending on who you talk to. Her actual name is Itzau. And, you know, does she have the capacity to wipe out mankind in a heartbeat? Absolutely. She'll be fine. Mankind, not so much. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm thinking here, because I'm, I actually I'm getting quite, uh, questions in my mind uh, that as we go here um, and, and actually having been off world races in your past lives uh, makes complete sense why you'd be in communication with so many races now yeah you know I never really thought about it that way before but yeah <laughs> well because many of them already know you from your, your past energies if that makes sense yeah. like I've, I've run into a number of humans this lifetime that I knew in past lifetimes this, you know, this one. Like, I ran into... Oh, that was near disaster. Um, I ran into into a lady I used to date uh, 200 years ago. Right? 
that was that was a, that was an entertaining run in. But when you think about it, like when you meet up with a friend of yours, you know, that you haven't seen in a long time, you know, and you sit down, you have coffee, you talk about things just as though they happened yesterday, even though it's been years. In my case, it just happens to be a few extra years. Right. So, I mean, when I run into somebody, like, I, actually, it was only about a year and a half ago, I ran into a chap that I hadn't seen in probably, well, on this lifetime, on this planet, 2,000 years. But prior to that, it was something in the neighborhood of closer to a million. Yeah, we hit it off really quick and really solidly. You know, it was just like sitting down talking just as though you were having coffee with him. <laughs> 200 years ago. <laughs> well, basically, yeah. I mean, that was that was a short one. Right. You know, funny part with that particular relationship, she recognized me first and then introduced me to her current husband. And it was her current husband that made sure that I joined them out at their place for dinner for the next three years running when I was up that end of the world. Okay. And yeah, and that's common with past lives. Uh, if you have the the recall from reincarnation uh, from past lives you've had, uh, that's what many people call a soulmate. Soulmate doesn't have to be someone you married or, you know... <laughs> Uh, I know people that uh, have killed other people in past lives and they're friends now. So, yeah, just, well, to, clar just to clarify that. <laughs> you know, half the people I know this the time I burned at the stake 400 years ago. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and that's my point exactly. You know, I think people get confused by the term soulmate. That means, oh, we were married, uh, you know, 10 different lifetimes. Um, no, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> the soul mate is is the person that when both of you physically pass away, your souls will merge to become a higher entity. Right. Now that's one of the things I've been working on is getting it onto paper so I can lay it out and show people exactly how the whole soul mate, uh, soul family, twin flame thing works. Okay, I want to yeah. I, I want to focus on our Keith Andrews. So, besides talking to alien races and communicating with fifty nine different races, what do you do? Besides doing that, yeah. Well, professional psychic, astrologer, you name the tool, I probably use it. Of course, I'm also a published author. I mean, right now I've got I've got two self help books out. The one novel and a and the reference the reference manual that we've just put out, which is what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Currently, I'm working on thirty four different books from different from different genres. I'm in the process of writing, and I've got ten more in backup that I haven't even started. <laughs> oh, you're going to be busy for the next year. Well, actually, yeah. probably the next ten years. But yeah. <laughs> you have more books out by uh, next Paracon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> at least a couple. Uh, Chris, you got any questions so far? Are you picking on me already? Yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, Keith, looking, I'm just sitting here looking at your uh, Races of the World book. Fascinating. And out of this book, well, not necessarily out of the book, but which race would you, yourself, never tangle with? None. So there's not one particular most dangerous race that... Well, let me put it this way. Um, one of the more dangerous people, as far as humans are concerned, is, is, that I've run into was a chap that is known amongst many cultures as Mephistopheles, a rather well-placed daemon. And the day he ran in, that I ran into him, he he showed up in my house. There were, you know, there were four other people with me. We were sitting down to lunch. 
And when I say this guy came through the door, I don't mean he opened it. He came through the door. And in a really, really oddly vibra vibratory voice, he looks at the five of us and goes, I am Mephistopheles. You will fear me. Mm -hmm. Well, the other four people ran up against the wall and turned absolutely chalk white, which probably would have been bad if one of them hadn't been black. Right. I just looked at the guy. <laughs> I just looked at Matt and I went after lunch. So he repeated himself. Mm -hmm. I looked at him and I said, we just covered that after lunch. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's when F and P would probably look at each other and laugh and go, yeah, okay. What's next? Um. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. So, would I tangle with any of them? Yeah. I mean, I'm a pacifist. Okay, on this planet, there is no way I'm going to fight anybody. Um, right. But, I was on a consortium ship one day, and I can't blame the guy for looking down on me. There was a young adult from Thotian, which is your reptilian, seven and a half to eight and a half feet tall. This guy was clear over eight, so I can't blame him for looking down on me. Hmm. Right. I mean, heck, I'm only 5'7". Right. He looks down on me and he goes, why should I listen to you, a simple Solarian, in, in matters of war? Split second later, his two buddies grabbed him by the arms and picked him up and, said, and looked at me and went, not to worry, we'll explain to him in the morning when he wakes up in the infirmary. <laughs> oh. Uh. You know, the reality is my my dad actually used to tell me that the one thing that worried him about me and the and the paranormal world is that I've got absolutely zero fear of it. Mm -hmm. I have more fear about humans. I don't. I have tools to take care of them too. Yeah, um. you. It won't be <laughs> close. Oh. Okay, so what was the first race you remember being in contact with in this lifetime? In this lifetime? Yeah. Uh, the first one, I re well, the first one that I remember being in contact with, well, that's a little hard to tell. Definitely <laughs> was one of them. It was Council of Twelve I ended up seeing all at the same time, so I'm, certain, I'm not entirely certain which one was which. You like which one was first I recognized? Oh no! Then just let's talk about the Council of Twelve. Well, the Council of Twelve is the group that actually runs the consortium. So now, that's cool. So the Council of Twelve are like the, the consortium's higher boss, essentially. Ultimately, yes, okay. they're the ones that dictate what the consortium, how the consortium runs. Okay. Okay, okay. Now, do uh, understand they do not have a dictatorship. You know, they, they are they are the Council of Twelve for a reason. The first, the biggest reason is when anybody has a complicated problem, they go to these guys, and there is a there's a whole long discussion. And if on the twelve, if it's a split decision, if six of them say one thing and six of them say another then the final decision gets made by the person asking the question. Right. Mm -hmm. The thing you got to understand with the Council of Twelve is that there are, there are at least 2,500 different member races of the consortium. Right. All 12 of them get seat on the council. But the fact that the one, the one rule there is there is never more than one member of any given race on the council. So, so how did they make the Council of Twelve? Well, they, the different races nominate the people that they, that they feel are the, mo are the best suited of their race. Qualification being they have to be completely non-judgmental. Non they have to be extremely even-handed. Right, and they've got to have absolutely no interest in self in promoting their own well-being. Once that is done, then you, you go through a very long convoluted process of of electing who ends up in the in the seats. 
They've so, always got three seats, three sets of council ready to go. So, because, con, so kind of like the original concept of the UN. Ultimately, yes. Now, does the Council of Twelve have enemies? Are there any races that despise the Council of Twelve? Oh, absolutely. Hence why they are still at war. Which races uh, don't like the Council of Twelve? Well, one of the biggest ones, and this is this is where I run into a problem because I keep forgetting what the heck they. And some of the names, and this is why I wrote it all down. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I what I keep calling the mechanoids. Okay. Okay. Are they are absolute much as they are part of the consortium? They are absolutely against the Council of Twelve, telling them what they can do. So, okay. are, they, are they a threat to the Earth? No. Just See, the Council of Twelve. They're not even a threat to the Council of Twelve, in all fairness. Okay. They're more like an upstart child that just likes to make and likes to make a lot of noise. <laughs> you know, think of it this way. You're dealing with people that are running on, you know, they, they run on a very different, excuse me, they run on a very different outlook. But they do run on, a, on an electrical nervous system. Now, the Council of Twelve happen to have a weapon. They can shut them down in a heartbeat. Quite literally. Because all they do is they pull a trigger on this thing and it shorts out their entire nervous system. You know, you you take something made made out of out of metal that is run on electrics. What amounts to electrics? They're really bioelectrics. Okay. okay. When you when you take a look at that, you pull the trigger, and all of a sudden, they've got no mobility. Which you know does eliminate the threat thing. The other issue here, and this is where they run into a problem that they're not aware of, or that they haven't figured out how to compensate for, is that humans have the actual key to taking that to eliminating the problem. Yes, humans have this thing about about not believing in their own capacity. Humans control something called zero point energy. Literally speaking, that means they can modify reality. Especially if they can learn to pull together. Right. So it's basically like collective consciousness. Ultimately, yes. Okay. Which is why we, which is why the powers of me keep the uh, the country divided. Yes. <laughs> you see, I mean, I love the movie A Bug's Life. <laughs> they pointed that out in any Okay. Okay. Um, by the way, I was just looking and looking because sometimes I forget names. I mean, I'd forget your name if I didn't write it down. Um, but, you know, in Bugs Life, they said, you know, one, one human, you know, if you translate it, one human is not a problem. You get them all together and all of a sudden you've got a major problem. Mm-hmm. You know, and do understand, let, let's be very clear here. Government is necessary for a society to exist. And overthrowing government, read Animal Farm if you want to see how that works. Yeah. And, okay. yeah, it's a necessary evil, I agree. It is. Because you've got to have somebody there, and you're never going to, there is not a government on a, in existence that's going to make everybody happy. And by the way, that includes themselves. Right. Okay, what is the friendliest race toward humans that you've met? And with that, what's the race that hates the humans the most? So it's a two-part question. Yeah, and I kind of figured you were going to, going to go that direction. <laughs> the, the ones that have some of the most fun, okay, you know, there's, there's a lot of them that get along well enough. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just trying to remember. See, the A2R and the E2RE actually have the most fun with them. The Irish get to run into the E2RE the most. Those are, your, are what humans call leprechauns. They're not actually an off-world race. They evolved here. 
Right. Leprechauns, actually, I, I categorize in the Fey realm, which is probably inaccurate, but they are an ancient race. Well, yeah, they are an ancient race. That's something I've been having trouble trying to figure out is exactly what people are referring to when they talk about Fey. Mm-hmm. Because the reality is the number of different races that I've heard people mention are Fey are distinctly different. Um, you know, that that's where I run into a little bit of a little bit of fun, if you will. Right. Now the Tan are definitely a race that does not like humans. Which one? Right. The Talon. They they literally look like ants. Ooh. And they are nasty and un, and uncooperative as you can get. I think it was I saw something like that and it was either outer limits or the twilight zone. Where there's yeah. an alien invasion and they look like ants. Yeah. The back funny in the 70s. Movie, it was a B class movie called Them. <laughs> Them? Now, the reality is, them they showed as being 68 feet long. The tail on are actually only about four feet. Okay. Four feet long? Yeah. Picture, if you will, a driver ant four feet long. Now, there's a horror. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah. You, got, you got any questions yet? I'm just reading up on the tail on now. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I also have your book, Keith. <laughs> yeah, I just managed to get oh. it. I, I don't know how well it's going to work, but I've got it now on Facebook, on Marketplace, and on eBay. Good. Well, perfect. And we'll throw all those links up in the uh, chat room, um, and we'll be pushing it at the end of the show for sure, because I think it's probably the best resource book. And I have a couple questions in reference to... Uh, well, well, we'll get to them. Um, so, going to the... Oh, God. So, I'm bad with the names, too. The one we were just talking about. The one that hates the humans. What Talon. Does, the, the, yeah, the, the Talon. Talon. What does, what does their craft look like? Well, they've got, a, they've got kind of an interesting setup. Okay, you don't see them very often. But, you know, and quite frankly, I don't know if anybody's actually seen them recently. I mean, they're here, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, speaking of that, I am already working out the working out the writing, or not the writing, but the sketches for them. For the different crap that is. Could it make it so much easier when we get reports in FMP of, I saw a dish-shaped craft with green lights and... Uh, it was strobing, and it moved like this, it moved like that, it looked like this. Then we can look in the book and go, oh, well, that was this race. And their motivation is this. You know, it, it just makes our job a lot easier. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, when you're trying to do your job, it'd be so much easier to be able to look at it and go, oh, now we know what we're up against. Exactly. And there are some of them that when you hear about them, you really want to second to sort of decide whether you're going to deal with them, because <laughs> some you go in shooting, so sort to of speak. Yeah. You know. well, and the other thing we need to know and look at is which races, and that's one of my questions later on in the show. But which races are working with the government, and why? Okay. Oh, in answer to your question, I knew there was, and this is one of the reasons why I wrote it down. I'm thinking like. I don't think the table lines have a having a vehicle. Well, they do, but uh, quite frankly, it's whichever one they can get a hold of. Mm-hmm. And this is why they don't get along. Because in their eyes, if you've got a ship and they want it, then obviously you're using their ship. Right. <clears throat> and by the way, that does not mean they're going to buy it from you. <laughs> no, they'll just take it. <laughs> Okay, when did you first meet the consortium? When did, that would be on the day I was born. Okay. Only you, I didn't know I was meeting them at, the, uh, at that time. So, were you born on the consortium ship, uh, as in your your soul energy born on the consortium ship, or? Oh no, my soul energy was born before the consortium even became a, a hint of a, of a thought. Okay. Okay. 
And I just gave you a really bad piece of information. This is why I got the book in front of me. Way too many things <laughs> going through my head. Um, the Talons, and this is this is the interesting part about them. They have a they've got a ship that literally looks, if you will, it looks more like a spider than anything else. Right, because it, it does, it, the thing will walk on land, but when it is coming into into atmosphere, it folds legs up over top of it and enters the atmosphere, whether it's entering the atmosphere or the hydrosphere, meaning going underwater. Mm-hmm. It folds legs up underneath where they're protected and then drops in. Okay, if you've ever, have you ever seen or heard report of a ship or of you're looking at the at the sky, at the clouds, and you see you know oscillating like kind of like different colored lights, usually red, yellow, and blue. Hmm, yellow. Okay, you don't hear yellow too much. You say which? You don't hear craft with yellow on them too much. I've heard red and blue, but not yellow. Yeah, no, these ones have definitive yellow, <laughs> but. <coughs> What it is, is they will light up the clouds from behind them. And I've seen that in YouTube videos. Yeah. Those are Taylor. Not nice people. No. I, I kind of get that uh, impression. <laughs> okay, so when was the consortium first formed? And who came first, the Council of Twelve or the consortium? Well... Technically, the technically the well, the original Council of Twelve definitely came first. Okay. The consortium itself patterned its governing body after the original Council of Twelve. So, uh, to to back up real quick, I've heard of the Council of Twelve before I met you, uh, but I've also heard of the Council of Nine. Yes. Are you, are you familiar with them? Is that the same council and the added three and now they're the Council of Twelve or is the Council of Nine something completely different? Council of Nine is something totally different. Okay. The Council of Twelve, the original Council of Twelve, the ones I actually met at the beginning, are the ones governing, if you will, what what humans would call reality. They are the, they are the people that govern the, the entire clockwork organi- organization of this entire area. Or more, and when I talk about the entire area, I mean take all of existence. And that may be a little much for mind you. That gets into that gets into a realm that most people won't call racing. That gets into a realm that you would much more accurately refer to as gods. Okay. They are they are a series of other races, but they go so far beyond modern understanding. You know, you're talking about the people that actually build planets. Right. Okay, when we're talking about consortium, we are talking about people that unify planets. Okay, so one's politics and one's construction, basically. Um, well, they're both kind of tied together. Right. Okay, the consortium is a governing body of sentient entities. Okay. When you start looking at the original Council of Twelve, they are the ones responsible for doing everything from creating said entities to creating planets. And they don't just deal with the sentient ones. They deal with the whole nine yards. Okay. Think of it this way. You know you know how to do, um, well, you may not yourself, but you work on a computer, so you work with different programs and make them work. Right. Okay, a graphic designer on a computer will do all sorts of things with the computer. Okay, but the computer has to be built before the graphic designer can work with it. The original Council of Twelve built the computer. Okay. Where does the Council of Nine fit in, or do they, and who are they? They are a minor group of, they're a, a minor group, and there's more than one of them, by the way. Okay. Um, that some of the more restricted races or less evolved still utilize. Okay, because a Council of Nine does not have the option of having a stalemate. 
whereby the person doing the questioning gets the final and gets the final choice. Mm -hmm. And freedom of choice is a karmic. It is a karmic law. Right. Okay. You have to have that freedom. If you don't, you you do not have the capacity to evolve. Now, is the consortium aware of the Council of Nine? Absolutely, they mm. actually stand. Many, <laughs> many of the of the lower rate of the less evolved races actually operate under a Council of Nine for themselves. Okay, which is one of the reasons why those particular races do not get a member a member seat on the on the consortium's council. Okay, so. Sticking with consortium for this first hour, uh, what's the purpose of the consortium? And I know we've talked about this many times, but I'm taking this approach tonight like nobody knows you. Yeah, no the the consortium's primary primary focus is the 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 sanctity or the stability of each of the of the member planets and the planets in the area. Like they are there to make sure that the that the different races maintain a static rule of operation. Okay, so they are the governing body that goes. Okay, they like for bringing it to Earth. They look at Earth and go, okay, Earth, the primary sentient surface dwelling race is human. They are the caretakers of this planet. Nobody is allowed to take over that planet. Nobody is allowed to take over the government. No, you're not allowed to do that. And you cannot turn over combat technology to humans. Because <laughs> humans no. are, quite frankly, not evolved enough to use them properly. Agree. They can't handle the ones we've got. Oh, <laughs> So Joe's got a question. Are there any humans on the consortium? In the consortium, the answer is yes. None on the council. Okay. So how do we apply for the council? <laughs> Number one, you got to eliminate a couple of things. First of all, we don't know. in order to even get to that point, the human race will have to unify on this planet. Because the human race has to elect somebody as a global as a global government. The human race has to pick somebody and go, okay, you're absolutely non prejudiced. You're our best bet for and you've got no prejudice towards any race, towards any culture. Right? You're willing to look at the cultures as independent on their own. But the human race has got to unify as a planetary government first that before rules, any human can get there. That rules out 99.9% .9 of the human race. Uh, <laughs> well, and, ultimately it rules the whole place out because the plan has to be unified before right. they get the election. Okay, and so Joe wants to know, is that Earth humans or humans from somewhere else? Um, well... Okay, he does have a point there. Mobians are actually human. But Mobians are not on the council at this point either. Okay, and where do the Mobians come from? They're, they're from the parallel uh, planet, correct? Yes, and quite literally they come from Mobius. Right. However, is... for those of you looking to see it in the night sky, you'll never do it. It's on the, literally on the exact opposite of the sun. Yeah. And we've talked, we've, yeah, we've talked about the Mobians. Um, yeah, on, on we the have. Show before. Yeah, so I know about them. Um, so this is going to sound kind of odd, but are other humans really in contact with alien races? Uh, you know, you, you've got other books of alien races out there. Uh, in your opinion, are these people, act, are there other people that are actually in contact with alien races? There are definitively other people in contact with alien races. Okay. 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 The unfortunate part is what I found with a lot of people is they like I've talked to a lot of said I've had lots of contact with them and you know, I have regular contact and yet when you actually run into them they don't recognize them. Which is intriguing. 
And I, I bring that up for a, a simple point of you, you see so many New Agers that are talking about, oh, the Pleiadians are so wonderful. I talk to the Pleiadians all the time. But, it, you know, the Pleiadians are either communicating with them telepathically from elsewhere, because, you know, you said before, the Pleiadians, Pleiadians cannot come here. <laughs> so Well, they can come here, but they're going to stay. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah. think they could handle the atmosphere. No, no. Right. So they would take over a human body to, to be able to do it. They literally would have to, like, do they tele communicate telepathically? Yes. They mm -hmm. are pure. They are, simply put, they are wonderful people, by the way. Right. But they are healers. Okay. I heard somebody tell me that, that Pleiadians were, they've dealt with Pleiadians for, for ages, but Pleiadians were a very hostile group, a very hostile, very arrogant group. I'm thinking like, well, I don't know what you were dealing with, but it wasn't Pleiadians. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and so I've known you for a few years. You validated a lot of the information I've gotten from other places, so I know you're the real deal. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, we hear quite often, oh, yeah, I'm in contact with such and such and such and such. I can't validate that all the time. Uh, yeah. So I, I, sometimes I, I do shake my head, um, uh, you know, and I try to analyze some of the information they, they give us. Uh, real quick, before we have to take our first break, uh, Joe also wants to know, do the Mobians ever come here? Yes, but you'll never know it. What kind of craft do they fly? Well, the Mobians have, have an interesting setup. You don't see them often, but they're a winged wedge. Okay. Um, and what I mean by that is they literally they kind of look, if you think about it, like a... They look like a cross-section of the old... Do you remember a, a show called... Um, what the heck is it called? Used to be done with marionettes. Um, it looks like an old, an old style, um, a cross section of an old style rocket, right? Either that or a modified plane. So it's a flying wing. In a sense, picture an ice cream cone with wings. Okay. And Joe says Thunderbirds. That was the name of the show. Thank you. The rocket they used. Thank you, Joe. The 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 rocket they used on Thunderbirds. If you cut that in half and look at it, you know, if you if you cut it from the top to the bottom in half, and look at that half, that's about what it's going to look like. Okay. And real quick, uh, we have about five minutes left. But uh, Trip wants to know. Have you ever thought about finding where they are from and connecting them on like Stellarium? Uh, let's see, are you talking about Mobian's trip? I missed part of that. About where they? Oh, oh, I see. Okay, it was. I did. I had trouble understanding what you were saying. <laughs> you know, um, I leave their interactions with each other up to them. They want to find out. I'll talk to them. But, you know, the reality is I am not a good politician. Oddly <laughs> enough. You know, it gets fun. But have I have I found out? Well, I know where the Mobians are from. They originated on Earth and about 40,000 years ago they vacated. Why? Well... Frankly, because they were bored. <laughs> okay. Well, 40,000 years ago, I, I, I could probably kind of see that. 40,000 years ago, humans had, had unified the planet. Right. There was no fear. There was no, there was no jealousy. There was no anger. There was none of it. But about 40,000 years, well, um, no, my apologies. It would have been about 50,000 years ago they vacated. And the ones that were left behind probably turned around and done themselves in by accident. Quite literally by accident. So, since they are considered parallel universe, would they also be considered time travelers? 
first and foremost, they're not parallel universes, this one. Okay. And secondly, time travel doesn't work going backwards at all. Right. It can go, and you can go forward in time, you can look back over time, but you cannot get there. And that brings to mind that guy that's all over YouTube, and again, I do hate use, using YouTube as a, a reference point, because anyone can create a YouTube video and say it's reality. Um, but does anyone remember that time traveler that's all over YouTube that was talking about the Earth? The guy from the year 3000? Yeah, that'd be the one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, does he still have an IQ? Oh, he has pictures, supposedly. I can draw pictures that look like they were drawn from 3,000 years ago and from now, too. <laughs> Sadly, I wouldn't mean, looking at them. <laughs> right. But, you know, you, you can jump forward in time. The problem there, of course, is you can't get back. You can look back in time, and you can assess what happened. But right. you can't hear a thing about it. You, you can do a remote viewing of the past and the future, but you cannot uh, actually go and change anything. In the past, no. In the future, you can absolutely change things. Problem is, it won't change a thing in the past. No. We haven't gotten there yet. Oh, let's see. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and go to our first break, and when we come back, we're going to start talking about alien abduction and some of the races involved with, with abduction. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. You are listening to S4 on Spreaker.com. Come get spooked at the 4th Annual Forest Moon Paracon in Cedar Woolley, Washington, Saturday, September 28th. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot. Speakers include Mike Morin and Jason Jordan, R. Keith Andrews, and Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and so much more. There will be workshops and a VIP roundtable. Get early bird tickets now at fmparacon.com. We've had several days of 80 degree plus weather here in Concrete, Washington. My family's favorite way to keep cool in this heat is to stop by Java Zone 2 and grab a delicious iced latte for me and a blended mocha for my husband. Our son just loves their creamy milkshakes and our daughter can't get enough of their ice cream. The best part is Java Zone 2 is conveniently located just off Highway 20 beside Logger's Landing. And I'm proud to shop local for a business that has been a staple of the concrete and upriver community since it opened its doors in 2010. So if you're looking for a way to keep cool in this summer heat, come check out Java Zone 2. They're fast, friendly, and local. Hello, my name's Cole Wegleitner with Statement of Sound DJ Productions. We do mixing, monitoring, recording, and editing for all your audio needs. For our local listeners in the Skagit area, we are taking bookings for your 2019 events and parties. We have a wide array of music from any genre. Please allow us to help you make these memories last forever. Contact us at 360-999-2830 or on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash SOSDJPro. Forest Moon Paranormal is a non-for-profit emergency response team that handles all aspects of the paranormal, helping you, your family, friends, and community since 2004. Whether you're having a problem with hauntings, spirits, Bigfoot, other types of cryptids, or UFO activity. Maybe you're just unsure of what's bothering or terrifying you. Or maybe you're just afraid of criticism and disbelief. FMP is here for you. We handle cases globally and locally from our headquarters in Skagit County, Washington. We never accept any form of payment for our services and are 100% confidential. You can find us on Facebook under Forest Moon Paranormal. 
You can private message us for assistance or just come join in the discussion and become part of our growing FMP community. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencers Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Space Star Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Space Star Radio listeners today. Join us on September 28th at the Cedro Woolley Community Center for 2019 Forest Moon Paranormal Paracon. VIP all-access passes on sale now at fmparacon.com. Your pass includes all-day admission to see the speakers and workshops, the Ghost Walk, a special VIP workshop, a special roundtable with the speakers, A Paracon t-shirt and an FMP Paracon swag bag. These tickets can be purchased from fmparacon.com. Get yours today. Hey everyone, Cole here with S4 Paranormal Radio, the official voice of Forest Moon Paranormal. Looking for a way to get the word out there about your business, group, team, or product? Let us help you. A few clicks is all it takes to get started at s-4radio.com. Or you can contact me at 360-999-2830. Welcome back to S4 with your host, Eric Cooper. Welcome back to S4 tonight. It's everything you want to know about off rulers. You can also find the archives at the Spreaker site and on the S4 YouTube channel for all the shows you've missed in the last three years. Anyway, back to the show. So, you know, while we were on break, Joe was posting in the uh, chat room about which craft should he be worried about seeing. And I think that's a valid question. So, we're, we're going to talk about abduction in this second hour um, and mostly what races are abducting and why. Uh, but what do you think, Keith? Which which craft would I be worried about if I saw it in the air? Well, in your case, probably most of them. Um, you know, the reality is that the triangle, the wedge-shaped ones that everybody sees you basically ignore. I mean, virtually everybody's going to worry about the abduction anyway. But the wedge shape, those are those belong to the consortium itself. Usually, those are manned by by Greys and Nords, okay. and they're the ones that are the least likely to cause a problem. And, the, just to, and um, real quick, just to clarify, most of the time with the Greys, the reason they have the Nordics before, and again, we've talked about this on the show before, but tonight I, I want to go over this in one fell swoop. But the Nordics are mostly there to calm the abductee down, correct? Correct. And their simple presence tends to do that. Right, because they're a humanoid, they look human. Yeah, they, they assume they are a absolutely perfect physical specimen. Mm-hmm. Right. But their presence tends to make people relax a little. Okay. So usually when you're looking at the at the wedge ships, you don't have anything to really worry about. Mm-hmm. Um, the saucer shape as well are something you don't worry too terribly much. Okay. The ones without a bubble, you don't worry about a whole lot. Those are men normally by graves on their own. Okay. Okay. The wedge ships you quite often have multiple different races, but the one the people you usually run into are the Greys and the Nords. Like there's people that have talked about being abducted in, in the in the examination room. There's all kinds of different races. Okay. Well that's governed by that's governed directly by the consortium. It's actually manned by their people. 
So why would the consortium be interested in abducting humans? Well, that's because the Greys are sanctioned by the consortium to do the work in the hybridization program, okay. which is the program that they use for growing cultural interpreters. Okay. Humans are just genetically geared to it a lot better than any other race. Right. So now with alien abduction, who is the most common to abduct? And you kind of you kind of already explained that it's usually the Greys, but yeah. Why are other races besides the Greys abducting? Well, that sort of depends. Okay, the Teclec, they you now when people talk about about wanting to be you know wanting to have some sort of encounter, they don't care who. <laughs> well. This has got to be one of the most... I mean, this is one of the reasons why I figured humans are related to the lemmings. All right. Okay. The tail on which we've already mentioned are no fun to be around. Okay. Because they'll do it just because they're looking for weaknesses. Which means they will put people through horrendous experiments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and what I mean by that is they and literally... Will test test the delay the amount of pressure necessary to break a femur, and they won't bother worrying about the about whether or not they're using anesthetic because they're not interested in whether or not humans like it. They're not interested in making the life you know comfortable as it were. Right. Okay. The other one that can be disconcerting, but it's not because they're trying to be mean. I've heard a few people talk about something that they say looks like a snowflake. Okay. And the snowflake ships are, they are owned by the vegans. Now the reason I say vegans can be a problem is because vegans don't do things to be mean. They're trying to understand the human, the human genome. But vegans have no pain center. Meaning they don't know what anesthetic is. They have no idea what pain is. You know, you take a vegan, you remove his arm. The only thing he'll notice is that that particular arm he can't pick anything up with anymore. Hmm. So they're basically medical scientists, like uh, humans are with animals. Ultimately, yes. With the okay. difference, humans understand what pain is and therefore go out of their way to try and make the animals a little more comfortable, usually. Oh, it depends on the human. <laughs> well, in Japan, I mean, the same thing can be said for grace. Right. Uh, so, yeah. real quick, Joe wants to know, uh, see, he shouldn't worry about the ships that he photographed and sent to you? No, the ones that he sent to me are absolutely not. Um, the only one that, that would be of any sort of concern, he sent me one that looked like, and I'd have to, let's see, where the I don't know where my phone is right now, so I can't tell you. But he sent me one that looks like a stadium. That is run by the Muldocks. And that one, if it ever actually picks people up, they are gladiators to the core. They are hunters. And they will pick up people and hunt them. Oh, but that's... Pick up that, somebody that can carry a gun. That's like the ones uh, in the movie Predator. That is exactly right. Right. Okay. Yeah, you know. the, yeah. I, I, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't ask them to come down. Um, I wouldn't take them if I were you. No. Yeah. <laughs> but you know me. I, I yep. don't. I don't go looking for aliens Not. anyway. They just kind of pop up. Uh, uh, okay, so the Teclex. You're talking about the Teclex. Teclex are the uh, meat eaters, correct? They're the ones that will abduct and you won't come home. Yeah, they, they if they pick you up and they invite you to dinner, uh, frankly, <laughs> it's a bad invitation. Yeah, you're the main course. Uh, and I, I do believe the Teclecs are uh, part, not all, but part of the whole missing 411 uh, theories that are out there with David Pauletti's. Uh, absolutely. You know, I can't prove that one one way or the other, but no. it absolutely fits the bill. It, it, it does, you know. Uh, and again, probably one to two percent of the missing people uh, with the missing 401. I think the other ones are government wormholes and portals and uh, things of that nature. I don't even yeah. think Bigfoot's taking them. Uh, but 
So what? Yeah, Bigfoot's pretty harmless from that standpoint. He doesn't believe in taking people. No. No. Uh, so with alien abduction, um, why? Who are the mantids? So when we're talking abduction, I, I think the three most common that I hear from abductees are the reptilians, which I see as the guardians. They're the ones that are uh, basically protecting the greys while they're doing the abducting. Um, you hear the Nordics, which are the ones that are calming the, the abductee down. But who are the mantids, and why are they involved with the greys? Well, first and foremost... The, the mantids are kind of a pain in the neck. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, they, 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 don't, they don't exactly do, shall we say, what they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. But the reason that they're involved with the, with the greys at all is because the greys are the ones that, can, that have... They've got the dominant, dominant right, if you will. Okay, as far as that side of it goes. Okay, and uh, yeah, just, remember, just, just, to, clarify, are, just yeah. to clarify for new listeners too, the so the mantids are the ones that look like uh, human-sized praying mantises. Yeah. So where do they come from? Um, they come in, that I'm aware of. They come from at least three wormholes away. Okay. Which, by the way, puts them on the other side of the on the other side of the Andromeda galaxy. Okay. Now, looking at history, who was abducting Betty and Barney Hill? And that would be back in the '60s in I want to say New Hampshire. Uh, but when she was under hypnosis, she actually drew Zeta Reticuli. Um, under again uh, under hypnosis, and that was before they actually discovered Zeta Reticuli. So yeah. which which race would that be? That's the Greys. Is it okay? Yeah. I know there's what. How many different races of Gray are there? About fifteen different colors that I know of. And they all come from different locations. Well, no, they, well, technically, it's kind of like humans come from all sorts of different different locations on the planet, too. Okay, okay. Because I know, so, I'm, gonna, I'm going to reference a whole other book, but have you ever heard of the Slipsy Ray? I've heard of it, I've never read it. No, it's a race. It's a, a, one of the gray races. Yeah, and I suspect... Um, unless I misunderstand that, is likely the ones with the really elongated jawline. Okay. Almost that, a triangular forehead or a triangular face. Right. And I'd have to look that book up again. And uh, and, and that's what fascinated me because when I, when I found the ARB, the Alien Races book by Dante Centauri, and it was, you know, when we first met uh, you and I and we were comparing notes with his book, you knew a lot of those races but with different names. You knew them yeah. by description, basically. So I found that fascinating because he was hearing, and this was done through the KGB, so it was done, uh, you know, completely by humans that weren't in uh, real, uh, weren't talking to them, weren't communicating with them, just basically by crafts, crashed craft, things of that nature, I believe. So that's where I found, uh, read about the Slipsy Ray. Um, so how many races are you aware of that are abducting? Well, right off the top of my head, and I haven't actually documented this entirely, but right off the, off the top of my head, you're probably looking at a dozen that are doing it for their own reasons. Right. None of them are working on a governmental quota. A, because uh, whether or not human governments will be willing to do it is irrelevant. The consortium itself isn't. Okay. So they're doing it outside the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, consortium. Well, more than... No, no. They may well have... The consortium does go, yes, you can pick up people, but you have to clear their mind. Put them back in as close to normal shape as 
you know, un, undisturbed as you can get away with. Because so they don't want to alter man in the evolution of man. Right. So don't put him back with a missing arm or you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, leave all that part doesn't try and dress them the way they belong that way, the way they belong dressing. Unfortunately, it doesn't usually, you know, it sort of keeps, put them back where you got them. Yeah. And, that's, and that's proven kind of hard in some cases, because, you know, I, I recall the case where they picked up the whole car and the car was returned on the wrong side of the freeway. They had to retake the car and put it back the way it was supposed to be. Yep. Um, <laughs> Sometimes they get a little screwed. you got to remember, cars on Earth only run in two dimensions. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, no. and, then, and then I always think of Travis Walton. But that was kind of an accident. Yeah, that was very much an accident. That was, that was a funny conversation. I met Travis, um, fabulous man. So, what was his response when you uh, told him you were on the craft? Well, I didn't actually tell him I was on it. Okay. What okay. I told him because <laughs> I'd been watching it since the moment it happened, since I'd been watching the event. Right. And when he and I got got discussing what was going on, and no, I'm not going to go into that, but um, when we got discussing, he looked at me, and he got a real funny look on his face, and he's like, um, there is only one way you could know what was going on. <laughs> I went, yeah. Uh -huh. And that's when he told me the only way I could have known is if I was there. I looked at him, and I said, well, I did tell you that, I, that I've seen it since, the, that I've been tracking it since the day it happened. And he looks at me and he goes, um, yeah, but I didn't realize you were being that, you know, that direct. <laughs> and he says, well, that ain't my doing. <laughs> thought I'd been pretty clear. I said, the moment it happened, I was, I was watching what was going on. But the, the thing is that the Greys are, they're a wonderful group of people. A little screwy on occasion, but very nice people. And where did the Greys come from? They kind of, they originated from say the reticuli. Okay. And where are okay, they now? That's their home planet. Say that again. I said that is their home planet. Okay. And have they colonized? And where are they now? Well, they're all over the place at this point. <laughs> have they colonized Earth? No. Has anyone colonized Earth? Uh, not the uh, Forelders. There's a number of ancient races that live here. But the Elseworlders aren't allowed to, to colonize. Okay. The problem with colonizing is it means you immediately start expanding. So are there any races that you're aware of that are outside the consortium permission, essentially, that are here? So there's a few I'm aware of, but the fact that they're outside of, they're, they're not here in force by any functional stretch. And the odds of anybody running into them are less than they are at finding it. I mean, let's face it. Mankind has only, I think at last count, they, the scientists figured that they had only identified maybe 2% of the surface of the surface entities on this planet. Okay. Bear in mind, some of the races that are here are a whole lot smaller than humans. You know, some of the off-world. Right. Okay. But many of the of those ones, it's not so much that they're trying to colonize as they can't do anything about it. Like, you look at the Laborians, for instance. They are here because of a bad situation. And they just plain can't go home. Why not? And where did they come from? Well, they were kidnapped from another star, star system by the Kamalians. And the Kamalians ended up dumping their ship into the bin. That provided the, uh, the absolute perfect route for the, for the Laborians to break away. Right. But the reality is, Laborians do not look human. You know, they look humanoid, but they would never pass for a human. And where are they now? Right now, scattered scattered about heavy, like when we're talking heavy forests, you'd have to go right into the heart of rainforests. 
Okay, it's like Amazon. Yeah. <clears throat> you might even find them up in the up in the Northern Rockies. Okay. Okay. Because, I mean, let's face it, the Northern Rockies run right through a rainforest. Right. So, what are the various, and I know we, we kind of hit on the, we kind of hit on the hybridization program, but what are the various reasons for abductions? One is the, well, from the gray standpoint, it is literally the hybridization program. Some people, when you look at the Kalons, they are looking for weaknesses. Because if they can ever get past the, past the consortium security measures, they will go after the planet. Okay. Um, Techlets are, are after people simply because of one little detail. Snack food. Right. Okay. The Tormanon are quite readily, and the Tormanon are another reptilian race that are about seven feet tall. They look remarkably like Thrasazians and like Drakes for that matter, just in smaller sizes. But they're mercenaries. They will, they will kidnap people to sell them. Okay. And there is an interesting market on the in outer space for, yeah, for human, human slaves. They're usually seen more as, more like a chia pet. <laughs> and what do the Tormelons fly? The Tormelon will fly anything they can end up with. And they don't care what race it is that they take it from. You know, they'll either take it or they'll buy it and take your pick, but they are not fussy as to what as to what ship. You know, there's a couple of ships they won't take. You know, but for the most part, it's whatever they can get their hands on. Okay. Okay. They don't tend to take, to take human ships because, well, human ships just don't have the capacity to go very far. No, we don't have the technology. Well, not that you put to use anyway. <laughs> no, not for what they want. Okay, let's talk implants. So each race has their own implant. We've talked about that numerous times on the show. Um, yeah. So what implants are you aware of and what are their uses for? Well... The the big the easiest one to look at is the one that Gray has developed. I've actually that's one of those funny little sketches I was supposed to bring down. Found the book I'd written it on, but the uh, dex the dexal spanalyzer. You know that funny little mark that you, that people have with the three dots that look like they're in essentially an equilateral triangle. Right. And then there's that little bar at the bottom. Okay. That is the thing that graves you to to get and to pull DNA to extract DNA on a triphasic on a triphasic uh, foundation at the same time that they are programming and installing a plant to an implant to track where people are. Okay, and what those two implants are for is literally. They are used for migratory patterns of humans, as well as um, what's the word I'm looking for? Situational modifiers to to see what happens when certain events happen to these people. They want a, a real time relay of stress re of stress production. Okay. You know, Go ahead. That's the that's the most common one. Okay, but you have some that are used for that are put in to track nothing but pulse. You know there there are when you find the ones stuck in the back of the head, like right. right near the cerebral cortex, they are trying what those are designed for is they track cognition in the human genome. At the same time, as they are checking the the subquantum level of of communication, they're actually tracking thought to see how how humans are evolving, whether the brains are actually getting stronger. Yeah, you know, I hear I hear humans talking about getting smarter. 
and I'm looking at them going, the way you're treating each other, you haven't learned much. You might be getting smarter, <laughs> but what does it mean to be on the decline? Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, so they also track vital signs, it sounds like. Absolutely. Okay. Vital signs as in blood pressure, um, serotonin production. You know, they will track... Um, they will track blood volume, right? They also track the 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 um, the sonic impact of of stress, which is really neat when you start looking at the way their their computers read out. Well, I can only imagine that shit. Uh, <laughs> uh, <Huh>. um... <laughs> Multiple screen, well, millions of screens for that matter. Um, so let's talk about the hologram implant. Those were designed literally to confuse people. And the only time you usually use a holographic implant you know, or a holographic capable implant is if for whatever reason you cannot get the memory overlay to work. And there are some humans that will not take to a memory overlay. So we've only got, uh, in the myriad of cases FMP has dealt with, uh, we've only got two cases of the holographic implant. And we never, we didn't touch it because that's what's a place in the center of the brain and we ain't going to mess with that one. Um, yeah. But that one also does upload download feeds, correct? Yes, it does. That one is a free, is a is a free flung cerebral uh, cerebral um, uplink. Thought processes, emotions, biological in inference, the whole nine yards. It will even track you know, track um, genetic mo modulation. Interesting. Because they have, in order for the holographic implant to work, they have to have a constant communication line. Right. That's which, one of the reasons why they don't like using them. Now, which race is using that one? The greys do use it if they absolutely have to, but the vegans are actually the ones that you worry about. Okay. Okay, and again, the vegans don't, the vegans, the reason they use the holographic implant is because they understand holograph, and they understand humans are easy to confuse. And so they put the implant in, they can do, and that's the one thing they have figured out, is if they put the implant in before they do any of the operations, they don't have the big problem of trying to worry about the pain because the human doesn't realize they're in pain. You know, it's kind of a better setup than than anesthetic. There's no poison. You just completely divert the mind altogether. Okay. Chris, you got any uh, questions about abduction? Um, no. The only thing that kind of came to my mind was, Keith, how far advanced in technology are the off-worlders from us? In simplest terms, their computers are to to modern, to the best of the best computers that mankind has. They are as far above that as the best of the best computers mankind has are above the abacus. Hmm. Which is which explains entirely why when I said and when I told I tell people there is no way that a computer from Earth is going to interface with an off world computer. <laughs> Try getting an abacus to uplink with an IBM. Yeah. You know, that's I mean that's when you look at computers that's first. When we look right. at firepower the biggest, you know, the the main battle guy, the main gun on the on the flagship of the consortium. The barrel is big enough you could take the Titanic, turn it broadside, shove it down the barrel, and still have room to maneuver. You know, when you take a look at the at some of the more primitive weapons, they've got something called a coagulator. 
that will literally make every cell in your body, every blood cell in your body, free solid, as in coagulate. Well, picture how well, how long you're going to live if that happens. You know. And, and, and Trippin's making the comment they could travel light years to get here. So we're still using rotary phones compared to what they have. <laughs> Ultimately, yes. Closer to the string and the string and cup theory, but <laughs> I mean, you know, ultimately it's right. Yeah, I, and I, I can't wait for Paracon twenty twenty because Keith's going to be here talking about alien technology, and that's going to be an interesting uh, lecture for sure. Yeah, that's why I've I've started sketching some of the stuff. I'm going to have to find somebody else that can that can work on the the idea of taking what I've got and making it a little bit more, um, shall we say, clear. Yeah, right. You know, well, I'm really good with the with the stick man that fell down the stairs and landed in the garburetor. <laughs> yeah. so, no, but that's pretty much where my where my artistic ability goes. Right. So, cool. you got any uh, questions about abduction? So, the Greys are studying us for scientific purposes. Are we the only race that they are doing that to, or do you know of any other ones? Oh, no. Not the only race. They just happen to be... Because the Greys are, are constantly evolving the hybridization program, humans are simply the best at that. Well, I'm going to say, yeah. too, I think they're uh, abducting Bigfoot as well. Oh, absolutely. They're also abducting Littlefoot. But you don't find many of them anymore. Oh, so you bring up a new topic. So who's Littlefoot? Or what is Littlefoot? Um, what was the name of the... There was a show... Uh, uh, oh, Land Before Time. Little cartoon, you know, Little Dinosaur. Oh, okay, okay. I think, didn't they just come up with a new cartoon, uh, Cole, called Littlefoot? No, it's Smallfoot. Oh, okay, okay. And that's us. That's us? We is Smallfoot. Oh, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, I'm in the middle of, of sketching some of the, some of the technologies, some of which I'm actually in the process of building. Like there's and there's one I'm in the process of building that I will not turn over to people until I've tested to make sure it works the way I'm expecting it to. Oh. And no, you can't really turn it into a weapon because if you end up using it, and you try turning it into a, into a weapon, if I build it right, you get to fry your own brain. <laughs> well, that's not hard for some people. Uh -huh. yeah, that was gonna be hard. <laughs> So, Kayla, you got any uh, more questions? Um, <laughs> actually, I can't remember the name of the race that you were talking about, but in the very beginning of the show, when you said that you had had past lives as an electronic or a uh, light entity. You're talking the Zerzik. Okay. Um, basically, what I wanted to know about that <laughs> race is... <sighs> So everything has an electronic uh, signature energy, I guess you'd say. So you also said that they were telepathic. So could they communicate with us through, like, synaptic energy? Yes. Okay, so is that why, like, sometimes you might get, like, one of those sharp little pains and all of a sudden an idea pops into your head, or is that something totally different? <laughs> you know, quite often that, and depending on, on who it is or what the thought process is, um, you may well be dealing with that. Okay. I think it would, it would depend on what kind of information was coming through because, I mean, spirits can do it. Uh, there's entity types that can do it. Uh, aliens obviously can do it. Um, I think it would depend on the type of information that was coming through. Absolutely okay. correct. And when you were also talking about the grays and how there's like uh, 15 different colors of grays, so different races, I guess it would be. 
Uh, We're not different races any more than the different color humans are different races. Okay, well, would they change colors from, like, adolescence to adulthood, or do they stay the same color from the time of birth? I presume we're still talking the grays. Yes, grays. Yeah, they stay whatever color they're born, they pretty much stay that way unless they're out in the sun too long, at which point they may change to a slightly different shade. Okay. You know, kind of like humans stay the the same. Whatever color they are, that's Mm -hmm. what they are. Unless you're Michael Jackson, they stay the same color. Okay. I just didn't know if it had something to do with whatever emotion they were showing or anything like that. Like it was a color change. Oh. No, that, and that's a that's a perfectly rational question. Okay, but no, grays are whatever color grays are to start with. Bear in mind that means they could be brown, green, black, yellow. It don't matter. The only the only color they don't, don't tend to be is they don't tend to be striped. Okay, because I was just wondering because I've heard somewhere that grays would be closely related to plants with the photosynthesis technology and different things like that. So I was just wondering, because you know how you can have a, a rose and it can come up one year as a red rose and depending on the nutrients and stuff that it eats, it'll come up the next year as like an off pink. Yeah. Yeah. And the answer is no. Um, okay. Grays, first and foremost, you know, when, when you think about the, that side of it, number one, they are the plant. <laughs> okay. I you know I've heard I've heard a couple of interesting theories about grays, you know. But no, they are you know the reality of it is that they are um, they're very corporeal. They, you know, the only ones that the only race that changes color, if you will, by mood. Well, Swazazians have one part of their body, of their brain that actually, of their body that will change color, but that's because they use they use the color band to communicate. Okay. And, you, you know, so you hear all these different beliefs and theories thrown out there, and, you know, you got the ones that greys are actually demons, and you got the other ones that greys are actually robots, they're not really races, and... I, I I shake my head because all alien races that I know of are living races. They're not robotic whatsoever. Well, are <laughs> some some that are robotic? Yes, but then humans have built androids. Right, right. Okay. You know, are the greys a, a the greys are not dying? They are not photocopies. You know, Xerox copies, if you will. They're running out of genetic material. I got to say, my favorite theory that I've ever heard on what the greys are is that they're humans from the future that come to the past to (laughs) study and change us so that we don't end up living the same future as they have. (laughs) I've I've heard that one, too. Um, Well, I I heard a new one that was just priceless. Apparently, the greys have built the hybridization program to replace humans with hybrids. Uh, no. <laughs> well, See, got... the only race that I'm aware of that changes color by mood are the Korlars. The who? Right. Which are, they are absolutely perfect genetic mimics. You know, when you, when you talk about doppelgangers, these are the guys that can do it. Because they don't have a solid form. Well, they do. They are essentially a hundred and sixty pound amoeba. Hmm. Right. So the reality with them is they can absolutely mimic a, a human absolutely perfectly. You would never see it. But the way to keep to find out if you're dealing with a corlock is keep him awake for for, for thirty six hours. So Roughly. are these uh, so men in black? Men in Black yeah. uh, try to appear as human, but you can tell with the 60s and 70s versions of the Men in Black that they weren't human. Uh, would, would this be this race? Um, sometimes. Okay. 
Corlock is the uh, Corlock. You'll never know if you look at them. You would never know they were that they weren't human. You could run them through any bio scanner you wanted. You wouldn't matter because they can mimic it that perfectly. Problem is when they get tired, they melt, so to speak, they, because they hold their form by mental cohesion. Okay, so Trip's got an excellent question. I didn't even think about this, uh, and I've got twenty-five questions for you, but. What's up with the cattle mutilations starting back up in Oregon? They're the same mutilations as from the 70s. So, have you heard about the cattle mutilations starting back up? And who, what race, if any race, I mean, is it government? Is it an alien race doing it? Uh, but, yeah, I read something briefly. I believe it was an FMP post that cattle mutilations are starting back up. What's your thoughts on that? Well, number one, it would not surprise me at all to find out that the governments, that the human governments have started back into that because everybody's been pushing for, for uh, you know, admission and what have you. But the other people that are, are doing it, the tech like are definitely involved, right? And the reason for that in their case is because they are looking for the, for, um, What's the word I'm looking for here? New They're looking for the modifier. Okay. You know, they're looking to see what kind of damage has been done to the planet. You know, to the to what they consider their food source. Oh, cool. I, I, I got you. I got you. And, yeah, I was kind of confused. Oh, it's, it's, it's the, fine. The tech, so I, I was thinking the tech legs are meat eaters, so they're um, finding new snacks. But, yeah, no, that makes sense. If we're their food source, then, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, human delicacy. Right. Ultimately speaking, they taste good. <clears throat> kind of weird question about uh, the consortium and the 12. And uh, anyways, can so if a person is an abductee, can they request a council with the consortium to they talk can about absolutely the request it, But the the council of twelve, like the consortium itself, they've already had the discussion before and before an abductee gets abducted. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's kind of like a chicken asking if it was okay to talk to the farmer. <laughs> oh, great analogy. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, so. like, and once in a while, the consortium will, somebody from the consortium will, will come down and talk. The problem is that the, the council, the reason that they don't usually talk to the to abductees is because abductees are extremely focused on, on a very small issue. Right. Okay, like abductees, understandably, are concerned about their own well-being, right? Mm-hmm. And therefore, that is where the abductees usually go with it. So usually what it results in is what amounts to a counselor coming in to say, okay, what seems to be the problem, how do we deal with it? More often than not, that ends up being a Nordic. Okay, so the Nordic is essentially a crisis intervention counselor essentially yes yeah and they do have an interesting an interesting secondary purpose there have been some abductees that have broken away from the from the grays when the grays are trying to do their do their work well grays are not built to handle a fight no you know you sneeze and the poor little guys fall down (laughs) so that brings up a good a good point most abductees have no recall, don't know anything's happening other than strange dreams might pop up and they have marks in their body. What makes an abductee different when they can actually physically stand up and punch a, a gray in the face? Usually temperament. Either they are intellectually further ahead than most humans or they are intellectually further behind. So the technology is not able to do a, a lock on, basically. Ultimately, yes. 
Okay. You know, you know, and the problem is you end up with one that is intellectually behind. The reason it doesn't take is because the technology, and this is one of the things they're still working on, but the technology is designed to take standard cognitive ability and tap into that to work with. Mm-hmm. Well, the brain isn't working on a standard wavelength. It's not going to be picked up very well. Okay, I want to jump to a theory you may or may not agree with. It's something I read a few years ago uh, that popped up in a lot of different uh, sites and whatnot. But so there, there's theories out there that 22 races joined together to develop the human race. So, what's, yeah. your, what's your thoughts on that? Who developed the human race and who's watching the human race's development, which we know the greys are, but did any specific race develop the human? Yeah. The elephant race. Okay. They were the first race that hit the planet after the planet was built. Okay. They built the human race for the worst possible reason, but the only one they had at the time. Slave labor. No. Mm-hmm. Well, not really. They actually built them for war. Okay. Okay, they didn't build them because they didn't build them to do a whole pile of work. They didn't build them to go mining. Mm-hmm. They had dwarves to go mining if the dwarves really wanted to. Well, stopping them was going to be a problem. But no, the humans were built for war. War against other races? Actually, war against other elfin. At the time, the elfin race was very defined, very divided. But humans were very easy to to repair. They were very easy to motivate. What they weren't count, counting on was the the humans evolving to the point where they had control over you know, over zero point energy. Okay. So, getting back to the karmic law of free will, was the karmic law of free will still around back then, or you know how how that fit into them designing us for war? Karmic law dictated you must be true to yourself, do unto others as you desire them to do unto you, and energy out, energy in. The issue of building a new race was not a problem. It didn't inflate, it didn't conflict with any of that. They took an existing race, and they took the existing simian race, mm-hmm. and used it as a template, and then hyper-accelerated it. Net result, you have mankind looking an awful pile like apes. Behaving a lot like it in occasion, too. <laughs> right. So, did, but, so did basically, uh, we took that karmic law and did our own free will and ruined their plans? Well, their plan was actually pretty simple. The problem was that mankind developed on top of developing this issue. The free free will was something that came hand in hand with existence. Okay. There wasn't a question of um, it was the question of some people have free will and some people don't. It was a question of every living entity has free will. Many of them don't have the wisdom to implement. What they weren't planning on was humans turning and going, yes, we've got this aggressive streak, hmm. but now we've got this greed thing as well. Which is what caused the humans to turn on the people that built them in the first place. And because humans reproduce so much faster than many of the other races. Okay, and then eat the mothering instinct of humans to actually protect each other in spite of their own differences. Which you don't see today. <laughs> no, what you do. You don't see it as often because mankind has this brilliant idea. Let's show all the negative things about mankind so you don't see the good things. Right. Well, and the media the, the media manipulates all that so you don't see the good. You see only the negative. And that's where one feeds off is, is the media. 
Oddly enough, much as the media is doing it, the media does it because mankind is telling the media by its own actions to do it. Right. So I want to take a step further. Uh, since an alien race developed mankind and created mankind, when did religion step in and make it their own? Religion was an interesting situation. Religion started as a way, uh, and it, it started because somebody, and I can't tell you who, hmm. but somebody came up with the idea, like all the races have their own religions anyway. Right. But mankind took a look at it and developed their own religious outlook by going, we need to be able to explain what we don't understand. Net result, religion evolved as a way to explain the inexplicable until science could evolve to the point of explaining it. Okay. okay. And did any alien races step in and uh, help manipulate religion? Oh, Manipulate religion itself? No, but did some of them step in and capitalize on it? You bet. The Quaddle are a prime example of somebody that stepped in and, and capitalized on religion. Okay. The Chitawari had no qualms about capitalizing on it. Of course, the Chitawari have no qualms about taking people as slaves. Okay, and of course, as we all know, the um, when you look at the Roman gods and the Greek gods, the Nordics walked right into that into that role and went, "We're here." Right. And then, of course, the consortium showed up and went, um, "No, you're not." <laughs> Hence, why all of a sudden, in a matter of, in a matter of very short period of time, all of the ancient gods all of a sudden vacated. And everybody said they returned to Mount Olympus. Mm -hmm. Okay. What had happened was the consortium showed up and went, um, no, you see, you're not allowed to, to interfere with the evolution of this planet, so get off. And then right. they pointed the barrel of their battleship and they got off. Ultimately, yes. <laughs> I mean, you take a look at it. Now, the Norse gods were strong. Okay. But they were still basically human configuration. Now you take a look at the Thrasazians. Seven and a half to eight and a half foot reptilian. Carrying a mace the size of a medicine ball. Okay. The, the, Nor the Greek gods still didn't end up carrying much more than that. They didn't end up carrying a weapon that size. So, talking weapons, are any of the races still using, and I, I know the answer to this, but i got to ask, are any of the races still using primitive weapons? On a melee standpoint, yes. The Anjanas, which are what you would call angels, they prefer melee weapons for close combat. The Swazosians absolutely do. When you look at the... Um, when you look at the Talons, their weapons are, for the most part, by definition, by um, by comparison, very. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Very primitive. And Joe is going to love this question, but who uses pointy sticks? Humans. I thought. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought some of the reptilians used pointy sticks. Well, yeah, but that's only to play with their food. <laughs> All right. And, folks, hold on a sec. And we're coming close to the top of the second hour. And, of course, Skype had a drop for us. So let me pull everybody back in real quick. And... Uh, it, it just wouldn't be S4 if we didn't have a Skype issue, you know. <laughs> and it probably just dropped me and everybody's still going to be in the chat or in the uh, Skype call. But uh, hope, hopefully you're enjoying the show tonight uh, and you can find all these races in Keith's new book, Races of the World. Uh, so I'm joining back into the call here. 
And okay, who do we still have in the call? In the uh, the Quinlar. You know, the Kinlar, they are, well, three-foot rats is the easiest way to describe them. Okay, and so I uh, just had to uh, drop everybody, so uh, our listeners didn't hear much of that. There we go. Are you guys still here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Skype dropped me, so you all were talking, and uh, yeah, it just wouldn't be as for oh. at least one Skype issue. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so we're getting close to the top of the second hour. Um, does anybody have any last questions here uh, before we go to break? Uh, number one, there he is, Kate. Say again? Sure, Bye, cool. My question was if Brent was here. <laughs> no, Brent goes to sleep yes, by the second hour. <laughs> oh, no. All right. So, Chris, you got any questions? Brent does. Yes, Brent does. Okay. Does Brent know he does? He does now. <laughs> <laughs> Just by that. I wrote him down. I was like you, Keith. I wrote him down so I didn't forget him. Um, you said that, uh, well, I guess English isn't like a universal language, but how was I communicating at one time with the Laborians? I didn't pay attention if your mouth was moving or not. But... Well, it's time to say, but I can't hear the question at all. No, you're really, you're really quiet, Brent. <clears throat> okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, you said that uh, off-worlders don't know, in, know or speak English. What about the Laborians? How, how did I communicate that one time with them? Laborians can have learned how to speak. Well, sometimes they speak English depending on where they actually are. But they speak a lot of the Terran tongue. And that, and that brings an excellent point. So we have, and this will be a question later on in the show if we if we get to it, but we know that different races focus on different continents. How do they speak to the natives of each continent? Depending on the race, sometimes tell <clears throat> What do I get? <laughs> Are you still there, Keith? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, throat seeds. Give me a sec. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and go to break, and when we come back, we'll get to that answer. So stay tuned. You are listening to S4 on Spreaker.com. Come get spooked at the 4th Annual Forest Moon Paracon in Cedar Woolley, Washington, Saturday, September 28th. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot. Speakers include Mike Morin and Jason Jordan, R. Keith Andrews, and Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and so much more. There will be workshops and a VIP roundtable. Get early bird tickets now at fmparacon.com. We've had several days of 80 degree plus weather here in Concrete, Washington. My family's favorite way to keep cool in this heat is to stop by Java Zone 2 and grab a delicious iced latte for me and a blended mocha for my husband. Our son just loves their creamy milkshakes and our daughter can't get enough of their ice cream. The best part is Java Zone 2 is conveniently located just off Highway 20 beside Logger's Landing. And I'm proud to shop local for a business that has been a staple of the concrete and upriver community since it opened its doors in 2010. So if you're looking for a way to keep cool in this summer heat, come check out Java Zone 2. They're fast, friendly, and local. Hi. 
Hello, my name's Cole Wegleitner with Statement of Sound DJ Productions. We do mixing, monitoring, recording, and editing for all your audio needs. For our local listeners in the Skagit area, we are taking bookings for your 2019 events and parties. We have a wide array of music from any genre. Please allow us to help you make these memories last forever. Contact us at 360-999-2830 or on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash SOSDJPro. Forest Moon Paranormal is a non-for-profit emergency response team that handles all aspects of the paranormal, helping you, your family, friends, and community since 2004. Whether you're having a problem with hauntings, spirits, Bigfoot, other types of cryptids, or UFO activity, maybe you're just unsure of what's bothering or terrifying you, or maybe you're just afraid of criticism and disbelief, FMP is here for you. We handle cases globally and locally from our headquarters in Skagit County, Washington. We never accept any form of payment for our services and are 100% confidential. You can find us on Facebook under Forest Moon Paranormal. You can private message us for assistance or just come join in the discussion and become part of our growing FMP community. Are you having encounters with the paranormal, supernatural, or ufological that you cannot explain? Look no further than the SOR Sightlines Report, brought to you by the Experiencer Support Association. This is Ryan Stacy, head of the Research Association, TESSA. Soon on the Spaced Out Radio website, you'll be able to file your reports and have them researched for you. We are independent and ready to help Spaced Out Radio listeners today. Join us on September 28th at the Cedro Woolley Community Center for 2019 Forest Moon Paranormal Paracon. VIP All Access Pass is on sale now at fmparacon.com. Your pass includes all-day admission to see the speakers and workshops, The Ghost Walk, a special VIP workshop, a special roundtable with the speakers, a Paracon t-shirt, and an FMP Paracon swag bag. These tickets can be purchased from fmparacon.com. Get yours today. Hey everyone, Cole here with S4 Paranormal Radio, the official voice of Forest Moon Paranormal. Looking for a way to get the word out there about your business, group, team, or product? Let us help you. A few clicks is all it takes to get started at s-4radio.com or you can contact me at 360-999-2830. Welcome back to S4 with your host, Cooper. Welcome back to S4 Nights. Everything you want to know about aliens or off-worlders, as we call them. You can also find the archives at our Spreaker site and on the S4 YouTube channel for all the shows you missed in the last three years. And don't forget to check out our website, www.s-4radio.com. Anyway, back to the show. So, before we left for break, we were talking about language. And... Different continents seem to have different races that are focused on those continents. Like Australia's got, uh, I can't remember the race, but I know Brazil's got a certain race. Uh, the UK has got a lot of Nordic and other races. And, uh, you know, how do they speak, Keith? Well, it depends on the race, but when it, come, when it comes to vocal, they tend to focus on whatever language is being spoken. Like, for instance, if you go down into Central America, a lot of it is either is either Spanish or Portuguese. Mm-hmm. Okay. But there are still some tribes that speak, that speak Mayan. So what you end up with is the people doing the abductions 
have a tendency of being, of being trained in that in the local language before going down there. Yeah, you know, the thing is that not all humans speak the same language. Right. Okay, so the different people coming down to do the abductions in order to get the information right, they've got to understand the language and they've got to understand the reference point, which is where the whole concept of the hybridization program came into existence in the first place. So do any of them use technology as a translator? Yes, because some of them do, and the reason being that Terran languages are very easy to understand. They all come from from basic roots, mm -hmm. so it's not that hard to take a to take a, a translator for a for for the planet, right? Because a lot of them just a minor a minor tweak, and they can get it to work right. Because humans all have the same basic culture. You know, there are some some striking dissimilarities between them, but ultimately, if you take a if you take a human, doesn't matter where on the planet they are, you hold out a drink with liquid in it, people know, and you're saying it nicely, people know you're offering them something to drink. They right. may not know what the thing is, but they will know that's basically it's a, a cup looking thing. It's got liquid. They're offering it as a drink. There are some races that look at that and then take it directly as a threat. <laughs> well, we, you know, we've got that here where, you know, for example, uh, Americans, they give you the thumbs up sign. It means, hey, how you doing? Everything's OK. But you go to Iraq and do the same symbol. Uh, it means uh, basically F you. And so, yeah, you, you know, it, it, I, I could see that being an issue. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's face it. There's all sorts of, of ways that, you know, language can be screwed up. But where it comes to vocal, mm -hmm. humans across the board, their, their basic tonal inflections, you can tell if somebody's upset, you can tell if they're happy, that sort of thing. That right. can all be worked into a translator. Okay. Okay, so that's how they communicate with the, with the local denizens. Between themselves... There is a standard language that they speak between themselves on the vocal side. But that doesn't always work because some of the races don't have vocal cords. And is, okay. that where, is that where telepathy comes in? Yes. Okay. And so like we're, go ahead. You know, sometimes they end up using optics. Uh, okay, okay. Like visual symbols. Yeah. Also known as semaphore. Of course, you want to see something funny. Watch, watch an Adina, um, the Udima, watch them trying to do, to do semaphore. Hmm. Udima is your octopod. Oh, okay. So, was that, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie, um, The Arrival. Yeah. Uh, was that well, an octopod? That was Nudima. Perfect okay. rendition. Right those mentality, were, too. Yeah, and those were cool symbols they were actually making, too. Uh, great movie. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, so we were talking during the break uh, about music being in, in, you know, I always use movies as reference points a lot because, well, there's basically, there's... <laughs> A lot of fact to a lot of these movies. But Close Encounters of a Third Kind, uh, you know, they used tone and music to communicate. Um, yeah. And we were talking about how that's actually, uh, it is fact. How, yeah, how, I mean, that's, a, that's a thing. You know, they, they did find music does work very nicely. You don't have to, it's not... It's not a question of mathematics. It's a question of the sonic impact. Like, it, it doesn't matter what you call it. You know the old saying, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same idea. It doesn't matter what you call it. If that sound is what you're looking for, that's the way to communicate. You know, and that's why music works. 
Because how you get to that sound is not the relevant question. It's whether you get to the sound. Right. Okay, anyone else got questions? Yeah, all right. Yeah, you... brought me to a question. <laughs> Go ahead, Brent. Thank you. If I uh, am talking to some off-world ancestrally, and I have some headphones in, listen to music, would they be able to hear that? Or... Oh, yeah. Ultimately, it's because what they'll do is they'll pick up on, on your auditory receptors. Okay. Cool. So they would actually hear what Brent hears. Yes. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So I wonder if they like ACDC. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there's no county of the taste anyway, but... <laughs> All right, uh, Kayla, what was your question? Okay, well, like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you have the musical tones that do, 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 right? Yeah. But with the musical tones, you also have the light frequency that is at the same patterns and intervals as the tones. Yeah. Um, in order to fully communicate, because like you said, some of them uh, can't necessarily hear tone or can't vocalize, wouldn't you have to have a light frequency? Yeah, they call it triphasic communication. Auditory, visual, and quite frankly, they, they also work with either olfactory or, or, um, tac or um, what's it called? Tactile, that's the word. Okay. Okay. Oddly enough, those and they couldn't show it on the on the on the uh, movie, but all sound has a feel. Right, most definitely. Okay, all light has a has a feel. Of course, all of them also have a scent. So the reason for that those things worked was because of the tactile, optical, and auditory. Okay. So, so in order to communicate or send a message, per se, like through space to another entity, you would have to not only have the sound, but also the optical and also the feel, the physical. Well, yeah, otherwise you're getting every, essentially, think of it this way. You're trying to read a book and you're only getting every third word. Okay. Okay, yeah, you know, that's the biggest problem. And of course, the other issue that they did that humans did not have the capacity to take into consideration is when you fire a a radio wave in outer space, it gets modified by interference. Hmm. Right. Okay. It will get modified by atmospheric interference as it travels, or by gravitational interference. So your friendly message uh, hits an asteroid and uh, starts the galactic war. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, take it this way, and it's been proven on Earth. You say something above water, it sounds one way. You take it underwater, it sounds another. Okay, what humans haven't figured out yet is that biomagnetic flux actually modifies the way the sound travels. Okay, the combination of bioelectrics, biomagnetics, and the, you know, the oscillation between the two. Okay, switching gears. We know some races live in the mountains. What races live underwater, like in the oceans? Well, you start with the merfolk. Right. And they live underwater. Obviously, the, the seafarers do. Listen, and what you would call sea elves. But those are ancient races versus off correct? Yes. Okay. Now, the, the Odina also live, on, live underwater. Their ships are actually, and this is the one thing that they didn't show, was the ships, they, well, they sort of did, was they, they literally have their ships full of water. 
Yeah. Okay, now, of course, well, I was in, and they're technically an off-worlder. Your, your water elementals live underwater. Right. Okay. And then you have, you know, there are a couple of, of reptilian races. Well, technically, they're not reptilian. By human definition, they're amoebic, or they're um, amphibious. Okay. Um, and, of course, when we take a look at Lockspots, well, I'm just trying to think which race comes from off-world. And I, oh, of course. I just got to look. I remember coming. Not, it wasn't a question coming across me. It was a question of remembering where the heck they hole up. And don't mind me. This is why I built a reference manual so I could actually find what I was looking for. Right. The Zotar. Okay, Zotar are. They look, in simplest terms, they look like gecko. Like a gecko. Okay. They they spend a lot of their time underwater, but their technology actually permits it. The reason they go underwater is because you can't get to them. <laughs> Makes sense. So, the movie Abyss, The Abyss. Yes. Uh, what race would that be, or is that based on any kind of fact? It's kind of the 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 funny thing that look like it, and that look like gel. That literally is a water, and that is a water elemental. Okay, okay. Okay. Now, the race that was down there, that was your sea elves. Okay. And they are the ones that developed that technology that they used, is a real technology. It was sadly comical when, when, the, when, the, when the elf had started to surface again. They decided they wanted to talk to humans, but since they couldn't talk above water, they figured they'd take them underwater. Well, that worked out really poorly for the first humans they were trying to take. Because, as we all know, humans do not breathe underwater well. No. Especially at lower uh, depths. Well, lower depths, it worked out. You know, they finally figured out they needed to trap oxygen somehow. And mankind was uh, was oddly enough actually working on the same problem, unbeknownst to them. Mm-hmm. So we have the, the great big heavy duty, you know, underwater the diving suits of the of the eighteen hundreds. Right, that worked great. You know, it held the oxygen no problem. The unfortunate part was they didn't compensate for the pressure, which left the humans stuck in the helmet. You know the the overpressurization as they got deeper into the way into the you know into the into the trench. The excess pressure would actually crush the humans again, right. mainly for the communication lines. Right, and then the then the and then the the sea elephant turned around and went, "Well, we got to replace the we got to stop the lungs from collapsing." Net result, they developed this kind of a gel, which humans now actually have, although they haven't perfected it to the level they need to yet. Which is probably a good thing, by the way. Yeah. Some areas we don't need to delve into. (laughs) Well, there are some things going on that mankind will take a look at and go, let's see if we can turn this into a weapon, which is a really cute thought. Until you realize the thing you're trying to turn into a weapon already is one. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're military trained. How much fun would you have if all of a sudden your guns decided that they didn't like you? Yeah, that wouldn't work too well. You know, I mean, that's what and what people don't realize is not everything is a good candidate for weaponization. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. So, is the government aware of any of these races? And we, we kind of delved into that, but... Politely uh, put, most of them. Was that again? I said politely put, most of them. The government is not unfamiliar with the concept that off-worlders are on this planet. What the government doesn't want to tell you is that the contracts that were arranged and were signed... Mankind on the whole has broken. Of that Which, I have no doubt. 
And which races is the government actually working with? Strazian, Gray, they they only work with the hybrid side of this, but playing the hybrids. They do work, uh, some governments work with the Quattle and the Chitawati. Oddly enough, just about everybody works with the Dwarf and the Elephant. They just don't realize what they're working with for the most part. <laughs> there is a contingency of, of Mobians that the, that the governments are aware of. Okay. And of course, the Zazians are quite literally human allies. So, I know we've talked about this before, but originally most of these races started working with the human governments for healing and for medical purposes, correct? That is correct. But they were supposed to actually use that and release it to the general public. The government decided, no, can't do that. So they withheld it and tried to figure out how to turn it into weapons. Oddly enough, against or oddly enough, from the from the consortium standpoint, humans turned decided to turn it into weapons against themselves. <laughs> yeah. Of course, there was a mixed approach to that. Some of the off-worlders looked at it and went, well, that solves our problem. You know, it's like, well, if they want to use it on themselves, at least they're not shooting at us. You know, but what happened was the government broke the contract, so the off-worlders turned and went, okay, let's try these so-called corporations. They're in it for profit. Let's, you know, let's turn around and try to talk to them and get them to release it. Because the benefit was, from an economical standpoint, was far greater to release it than it was to, to keep it to themselves. So, unfortunately, go ahead. But unfortunately, the corporations decided that greed was far more useful than release. So, on the uh, on the contract side, I believe it was called the Granada Treaty with Eisenhower. Was that one valid? It was either Truman what? or it was either Truman or Eisenhower? I uh, think Eisenhower, but I might be mistaken on that. I'm not great on Karen politics anyway. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and it was either Truman or Eisenhower with the Granada Treaty, uh, where they. You know, you, you hear different theories about it. You hear different uh, stories about it. Fact of the matter is, he did meet. It's just a matter of which race did he actually meet with. Because it, uh, one of the theories was he met with the. No, he, he was supposed to meet with the Nordics. They didn't show up. Uh, he met with the Greys a second time. And ultimately, correct. The reason he was supposed to meet with with the Nordics was because they could actually articulate the language that, that the humans were using. Right. Okay. Now, was there a meeting? The answer is yes. Was there a contract signed? The answer is yes. But there was never a contract signed to go, oh, you can take X number of humans. Okay. Like, they tried it, don't get me wrong. But the off-worlders went... Okay, if we're going to be able to take X number of humans, you're not telling us which humans we can take. And you're not telling us what so what kind of social standing they've got. Mm -hmm. Because the idea that even at that point was, well, the homeless, they can be taken. You know, the, the people that are on the lower end of the educational level, you can take those. That's no problem. But you leave our, our brilliant people alone. Or you leave the people we like alone. Right. And the off-worlders went, that's not going to fly. Right. They went, we're either having free grain, we're either having the having an open doorway where where we choose. Because we're going to bring them all back anyway. But we are not having you control what our research does. Humans weren't overly impressed with that. Well, no, and that would be a biased uh, study anyway. And that was precisely why they wouldn't do it. And, and that makes total sense. You're not going to have an accurate uh, research program as an off-worlder if you can only take the lower class. So, See, it was because they, there was a couple of comments that were made at that point that the that the 
humans did not approve of. Mm-hmm. You know, because they started pointing out the lower, the lower class, lower education, right? And the off world is looked at and went, well, if they're so poorly educated, how come they're surviving on a fraction of what you are? <laughs> and that makes total sense. So is there any alien technology that we use today that derived from the off-worlders? Well, in all fairness, a lot of the genetic testing that is now being worked on was inspired by off-world technology. Mankind did the work. Mankind has figured it out on their own. Mm -hmm. But were they told of possibilities, the answer is yes. They just ignored most of them. Okay, like... You know, one one of the obvious issues is people the the off worlders showed human and showed the medical doctors at the time how humans can how their cells can be used can be actually stimulated to regrow limbs. Only humans decided that wasn't right because that went against everything they believed. Of course, the usual comment was, well, the fact that you believe it's not possible is actually half your problem, but, you know, I remember I remember one issue that happened where they went, well, you know, that's not possible. And the uh, one of the one of the little guys that I spoke to later, he was actually, he was one of the amoebics, and he turned around, looked at him, and goes, well, okay, what we do is not possible, so how come we're here? Of course, for some bizarre reason, humans couldn't figure out how they got there in the first place. Huh. So, getting to the government, why would the government hide the existence of aliens among us? Because, number one, they're afraid of the aliens. Number two, they're still trying to figure out how to capitalize on the, on the technology. And number three, if... If the, if the governments were to release the information that humans are, that aliens are here, all of a sudden, the government and the people in positions of so-called power are no longer the top of the totem pole. Okay. Now, do understand, again, the government is absolutely necessary for society to evolve. Right. But people in government are still human. Now, I think we kind of touched on it, but are there any alien races that have infiltrated the governments? On an individual level, there is undoubtedly some that have gone into it. Are there any in positions of actual power? Not that I'm aware of. One thing I'm absolutely aware of is that the number of people that claim that reptilians have, have shapeshifted and become any of the, of the upper echelon, you know, the, the higher, the so-called five families or the or the, one the or any of the well-placed government people. Okay, number one, no. Hmm. Okay, you got to look at the reality behind that. First of all, there isn't a reptilian on the planet that can actually shapeshift. <laughs> That's the first one running to. It, you know, it, it, it just, it, one of the reasons I ask that is because you know, some claimed Obama was a, was a reptilian. Some claim Queen Elizabeth is a reptilian, and they show these pictures of her eyes shifting to you know vertical slits and like really, that's usually tabloid information. But you still got some that glommed onto it. Oh yeah, oh there are some, there are some remarkable calls. The the thing that I will and I pointed out before, but the whole issue of reptilians infiltrating the government and taking over comes from the late 70s, early 80s from a funny little series called V. Right. Wonderful movie. Wonderful series. I used to watch it all the time. But are they here to take over the government? Why would they have to travel several hundred thousand light years just to screw up an already butchered system? (laughs) totally agree. And why would they infiltrate the government when they could just destroy it anyway? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, they have the capacity. Mankind has has still got this final problem where they have to use line of sight communication. 
mm-hmm. or limited yield EMP. With the size of the weaponry that the off worlders have, one EMP pulse will wipe out everything on the planet in the way uh, anything that has a, has a mechanical discharge to it will be fried. Okay, quite frankly, they could do the same thing and wipe out the entire planet. But if you're trying to take over a planet, you don't exactly want to destroy the land. Right. And that kind of gets to my next question with uh, what's the ultimate goal of many of these races uh, with humanity and then with the Earth? Ultimately, it's research. This is the greatest repository of information in the sector. Okay. And because of the fact that it is that, they come here to literally study, I mean, from a xenosocioeconomic standpoint, Earth is a hotbed of evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, you might question where it comes to minds on occasion, but hey, that's just me. Um, That's the biggest thing. Where it comes to the hybridization program, the human genome is the easiest to work with. It is the easiest to repair. Okay, and it has the added ability of being already predisposed to telepathic communication. Making communication on that level easier with other races as well. Mm-hmm. And Joe... Yeah. Joe is absolutely correct. When the aliens use their EMP device, his pointy sticks are going to rule the world. Absolutely. S4, S4 will still be running via <laughs> smoke signal. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and Bigfoot smoke knocks. Smoke will come into play really quick. <laughs> and we'll still have Paracon. You just have to walk here. <laughs> <laughs> So, are any of these races uh, that are either watching or manipulating, are they involved with weather manipulation? No. Remember that thing about leaving the planet to evolve of its own nature? Right. Okay. If they wanted to, if they wanted to manipulate the planet, okay, they would do something a lot more entertaining, like cause a 10-point earthquake in the middle of the of the American Empire, or in the better yet, they cause a tsunami to erupt right smack in the middle of the Sahara Desert. <laughs> yeah, they. Yeah, I can't even Im- imagine emergency management trying to explain, let alone respond to that one. Well, yeah, I mean, and you know, you want to see something really entertaining. Right now, you have class five class five tornadoes. These guys want to play games with with weather manipulation. They sat down and they set up a, a real a planet maker, and you'll have class seven hurricane. Hmm. Okay, you won't be dealing with these little with these little hundred mile an hour winds. Right. They just draw the jet stream right down to ground level. Now, Joe wants to know: Do aliens start forest fires? No. Have I any... mean, I doubt that once in a while they've had a problem, but here's the funny thing with a forest fire. If an off-worlder starts a forest fire, you take a look at the alpha race. They speak and they'll kill a fire off. Okay. I mean, if they don't let them get out of hand if they do have a minor problem. It's not like they get in the way and, and start arguing over who started it. They just put the thing out. Yeah, However, yeah. it will not stop either a lightning strike or mankind's ever in deal. Because a forest fire will never damage planets. Okay, in the local area it certainly will. But a forest fire in, in you know in California will have no bearing on food production in Africa. So the Amazon fires. Were they off world or was that human? That was human. That was quite intentional. It was stupid, but it was quite intentional. Okay. See, yeah. oddly, those were started as a protest against the against the cutting. Oh you know, yeah. Let's not cut it, let's burn it down. There's a good idea. 
Oh, yeah. <coughs> That's like Greenpeace, and I've said this before, but like Greenpeace derailing a radioactive waste train to protest radio, you know, nuclear energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not make, the wisest move they could have made. Makes sense. It's someone with a low IQ that wants to protest. Um, Bingo. <laughs> Uh, I had a question, but okay. Next one: Is there any particular season or time on Earth aliens are the most active? Uh yeah, that's been proven time and again. It's not so much a season; it's a it's a um, galactic event. Every time Mars gets to its closest point, UFO sightings triple on a global level. They come close to tripling. There are some of those because Mars is close? That is exactly why. So they're actually seeing Mars? Well, quite often they're seeing Mars, but much more importantly, ships are, are it's in the shorter wing ships <coughs> in here when Mars gets closer. Okay, okay. I just wanted to clarify that. And so. I've heard theories that certain states have more interaction with certain races, Texas being one of them because of the weather there. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, I can tell you the logic is sound. Depending on what they're on what the individual race is researching. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're taking a look at if you're taking a look at the at the evolution of, of human food supply Go anywhere where there are lot and where there are really big cattle herds, or really big chicken, you know, chicken producing places. You'll get a better, a better supply, a better cross reference, if you will. If you go to places that have them, you know, if you want to study dolphins, do not go into the middle of, you know, don't go into the middle of, of Nevada, for instance. Right. You're just going to see your free ranging, free ranging dolphins. So, looking at Texas, for example, I mean, only as an example, are there any races that use oil, for example, uh, use oil as a resource? You mean aside from humans? Well, something right. we got to understand. Number one, the answer is yes. Oh, okay. Um, there, there's a number of them that actually operate with with fossil fuel, but they don't use it for the same thing you're thinking. Okay. Okay. There's a couple that literally will eat it. You know, like you're when you when you start looking at it. You know, um, when we start looking at diet, that is. You know, oil is actually quite quite a. It's not so much a delicacy as it is extremely beneficial. You know, extremely useful, if you will. Mm-hmm. So which races would use fossil fuels? And would, well, they be, well, would they be off rulers or would they be ancient races? Well, ancient races absolutely do. The dwarven race absolutely uses it. Mm-hmm. Works really well, as sorry as you can well imagine. It burns like a like a monkey. You know, they're they're one of the biggest ones. Okay. You know. But when you take a look at the like the Chris and the Vol- the um, the Vulcans, they like they like their they like their underground spots as it were. Vulcans are not pointy or green people. Okay, they, Vulcans are literally a crystalline race, but they use Earth as a as a nesting ground. But yeah, the Korlock themselves actually eat the stuff. You know, when you talk about oil, the Korlock themselves literally will eat the stuff. They also live in it, by the way. Ooh, oil bath. <laughs> that doesn't even sound fun. <laughs> yeah, but then you, you on the other hand, have a problem. You hold your hand on your, your oil thing at the time, you're not going to have to even get anything. No. And then you definitely don't smoke a cigarette after you've had an oil bath. Oh. <laughs> well, it's not so bad if it's crude oil. <laughs> right. So, have any races throughout history worked with human governments? Uh, and, I, and I bring that up again because 
You look at Hitler with Germany. You look at uh, maybe Saddam with Iraq because you heard theories about that. You know, you heard the whole Stargate story about there's a Stargate in the Middle East and that's why we went to Iraq. I don't believe that theory, but you well, got to throw it to out there. Iraq for a much simpler reason. No, they went there for oil. No, they didn't really want the oil. The oil was a diversion. Okay. They told everybody they wanted the oil. That had nothing to do with it. See, the United States has more oil than they do. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, heck, we have, heck, more oil than they do. We have oil <laughs> reserves. Try that again? <laughs> Say again? Yeah, the the whole thing about their reasoning was absolutely a different setup. And do understand they the the reality behind it. Can I prove anything that I that I, that I see? Yeah. Unfortunately you'll find out about it in about thirty years. That's where you get the proof. Mm-hmm. You know. But the answer to your question, yes, the the Germans were in touch with the with the off worlders. So were the United, so was the United States, Japan or China, Japan, Canada, even Brazil was in contact with them at the time. All of the major of the major countries had off world interaction. Okay. But quite frankly, it's it's a very simple issue. Nobody wants to admit it, as given as evidenced by the fact that everybody's still questioning whether off-worlders are here. The funny part is that in in the Western world, people talk about about Hitler having access to alien technology. In the in the Eastern world, they talk about the states in Canada having it. Right. Okay. Ironically, they were both right. Okay. No, of course. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, cool. You got any questions? No, not at this point. <laughs> okay. Chris? No. Why are y'all so quiet tonight? You're just listening, I know. It's been a rough day. I, I know. I'm sorry. I get that. Kayla? Okay, um, well, you were talking about oil and all that. Uh, is there a correlation between merchant mines and alien sightings or UFO sightings? Sorry, did you say between mercury mines? Yes. Okay, just want to make sure I heard that correct. Um, the answer is yes. Oddly enough, it may not be what you think. See, number one... Um, much as mercury itself is, a, is toxic to humans, it is not toxic to every race. Mm-hmm. But the tech like have a very definitive interest in mercury. You see, mercury happens to be a metal, and the tech like are trying to figure out how to use it, or more to the point, how to affect it, because from their standpoint, that's going to become a very necessary little commodity. They didn't realize that mercury had said that that particular metal was here in such abundance. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And what does the tech-like craft look like again? Tech-like craft and tech-like don't actually have much of their own. Okay. Okay. Um, they are, because from their standpoint, they get around, you know, they, they do... Can we try English, or how about one thought at a time? What do you think? You know, um, basically, I guess the best way to look at it, have you ever, you might have seen them, they they look, you know what the Concorde looks like, what the plane the Concorde looks like? Mm-hmm. Take the wings off and level it out, and there you basically have it. They almost look specifically like a needle. So they got the cigar-shaped craft. No. No, no. Cigar shapes are much bigger. Okay. Because the, the needle craft are only maybe a quarter of the height of the, of the, of the uh, cigar. Because cigar shaped craft 
there are three races that really use them. You've got the Pleiadian, which use a solid cigar shape. They do come here, they just don't leave their, their ship. Okay. You've got the Drakes, which use the, the, the cigar shape with one bank of windows. The Srazazians, which use a cigar shape with two banks of windows. Okay. Now, Tormund simply use whatever they please, or whatever they hands on. You know, but no, the, the needle ones are, those are your tech life, and they are designed, they are extremely aerodynamic. So, the solar sail that uh, is like, I think it was last year, my, you know, it was last year, that the Harvard scientist uh, was talking about being off-world craft. Would that be a needle craft? No. Okay. The, the tech like don't require the solar sail. Okay. okay. The Nords developed a nice set of them. But the ones that you really take a look at where you're dealing with those, those are, are more often than not run by Roche. Okay. The, and see, the Roche's primary craft is the cone shape. But their luxury yachts are the, are the solar sails. Much like humans have all kinds of boats they use. <coughs> but they've got luxury liners they use as well. Mm hmm Okay, we're coming down to the last 10 minutes of the show, and I want to end this show on some fun questions. Do you have a favorite race to deal with? Well, that depends on the day of the week. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, quite frankly, I get uh, the ones I obviously get along best with, or more to the point, and more time with, is the Sazavians. Okay, now, but as far as the ones that I that you have a lot of fun with, I do personally like going in and seeing the sea folk. You know, the the sea in the alpha and the sea alpha. Mm -hmm. But the ones I spend the most time talking to, and I'll do it right in front of everybody, is the arboreans. You know, arboreans are your; they are quite literally the trees around you. But wow. you know, you think, so, so they'd you know, be so they'd essentially be dryads. No, no, they'd be more more closely akin to what you would call to what you would call or what Tolkien called an ant. Okay, or a tree ant. So the the walking trees in Lord of the Rings. Yes. Cool. The, the Dreons were one of the Dreons were dry, depending on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. Are they are a they are related to the elephant, but they got very heavily connected to, you know, to each out. They figured out how to, to how to work work directly with her. Okay, and the second part of that question: Which race do you just not like to interact with at all? Oh, that, that's the easy one, because they and them I do not get along. Mind you, they're getting less and less happy with me. But that would be the Talons. That's the info. Okay. They're the ones that I have the biggest problem with, and it's getting worse and worse for them. I'm still not impressed with them. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any last-minute questions? No. No. I can't believe three hours has gone by already. This is a right, where can we night. get your book? Well, that's the easy part. <laughs> you can get it directly through me would be one way. It's also now on eBay and on the on Facebook uh, marketplace. You know, I do know I know for an absolute certainty now that PayPal does work. Mm -hmm. So I do take it through PayPal. PayPal direct deposit, that sort of thing. And of course, 
if you happen to be local, you know, because, I mean, I'm, I'm up in Kelowna, so if you happen to be up this direction, then getting it from me directly is easy. I am going, I am looking into Amazon this week and see where else I can get around to it. And for those in the chat room, Trip has just posted the links to find his book. So just jump on the links and you can get his book right there. We've got a copy here at FMP headquarters. I know Cole and Chris both have copies. Um, great reference sources. Uh, you know, th these are the types of books that we keep in our truck. Uh, when we go out on cases and whatnot, quick reference guide to uh, identify what's going on, uh, what the motivation is, and how we can potentially help the contactee, abductee, whatever the case is. Um, are Keith, are these just uh, hardback, or can you get them in ebook as well? I'm working on the ebook thing right now. They're just in hard copy. <laughs> they're actually soft. They're actually soft copy right now, but. I am looking at into getting them done in ebook. I'm also trying to get them done in the auditory. I will not be the one speaking into the auditory. I trip over my own tongue. I'm not about to try and read one. No. You need Morgan Freeman. <laughs> oh, that would be classic. Uh, Cole, where can we find Statement of Sound EJ Services? You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com. And ideally, if you're in Washington State. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> so, great show tonight. Thank you, Keith. I know next week we're talking winter safety. It's, it, it's kind of jumping from fall. How is it in Kelowna? Have you got snow yet? Oh, God, no. No. Heck, barely gotten into cool weather. Wow. I'm still walking around in my t-shirt up here. Wow. That's how it is in the south. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's not a good marker. I think we're still sitting at 1314, which would be around the 50-60 mark. Right. No, we're, we're down in the 50s. At night, it gets down to the 40s. We're, we're heading towards snow. You know, Cheyenne... Our, our daughter says it's going to snow uh, like next week. I, I don't think that soon, but we do think it's going to snow before Halloween. We'll see. She's grounded. <sighs> I agree. Don't tell me kids not to swear at me like that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, next week we will uh, go into our uh, winter safety, uh, winter preparedness show uh, for the season. Um. <laughs> We're, we're getting cold here. The leaves have turned. My favorite season. You know, I love my pumpkin spice creamer for my coffee and whatnot. In fact, I've got pumpkin... What is it? Maple pumpkin candle burning right now. It smells good. Um, and, and one last time, Cole, where can we find Patreon? At patreon.com. So I'm just uh, real quick... I um, want to tell you guys a few of the things. So we've got four tiers that you can get on. Um, the first one is called Show Some Love. It's $1 per month. And you scratch our back, we scratch yours. You'll receive a shout-out each month at the roundtable show of S4. The second tier is the Forest Moon Paranormal Paper Trail. You'll get an informational overload, uh, a P uh, PDF copy of Forest Moon Paranormal Team informational documents such as Procedures, Paranormal 101, and How to Protect Yourself. A PDF copy of Eric Cooper's personal show notes from the last month of S4. And you'll receive a set of FMP and S4 bumper stickers to show off your friends. That tier is only $5. You'll also receive all the benefits of Tier 1. Um, our next tier is Coffee is Life. Life is Coffee. For $15 per month, you get um, an FMP S4 ceramic coffee mug. You'll receive the benefits of Tier 1 and Tier 1. You'll also receive... Oh, no, that's it. Ha <laughs> for $15. <laughs> for $25 per month on Patreon.com, you will receive the whole shebang. This tier is the biggest of it is for our biggest fans. You receive the benefits of Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. You will also receive a Four Spoon Paranormal t-shirt and six redacted case files from the FMT team. 
These will not include any names, locations, and or personal information. You'll receive one every second month of the year. So make sure you get on Patreon.com. Join us, FMP slash S4 Paranormal. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Excellent. Thank you. I do want to, to clarify that does not break any confidentiality of any of our clients. That is only going to show you the kinds of cases that we look at. Um, you, you're not, for, for our client's sake, I want to clarify, again, none of the information of your location, name, anything personal will be seen in the redacted files. Um, so it's been a great show tonight. Thank you, everyone, for coming on. Uh, so we have Cole Wegleitner, our technical analyst, Kayla Wegleitner, uh, one of our research specialists, Chris and Brent Dodge, extended care and national team, and our Keith Andrews, our alien race specialist. Make sure you go out and check out his book. Awesome book. Um, so October 20th will be our first team training. So for anyone that's interested in joining the team, go find the group. Just look for Forest Moon Apparel. Join the group. And it's going to be at 2 p.m. on the 20th. I've got a lock-in location still, and we'll go over the, the team dynamics and ethics. So thank you again, listening S4. Keep your eyes to the skies. Remember, it's you, the listeners, that give us a reason to produce S4. So stay safe out there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight on S4, the official voice of Forest Moon Paranormal. You can contact S4 through our website at www.s-4radio.com or on Facebook. Make sure you give us a like on our page and join the Forest Moon Paranormal group. If you are interested in advertising, take a look at our packages and contact Cole or Eric at 1-360-999-2830. Again, thank you. And remember... Keep your eyes to the sky.